Welcome to your sanity safe space with your favorite YouTube podcast duo. Skag 3, whoever he is. Get your plug fascist ass out of here! Saving the millennial generation in weekly installments. You are a terrific team on all counts. Live from a castle tower and his mother's basement, this This is the Matt and Blonde Show. I'll lead an effective strategy to mobilize true international over the person. (laughs) <laughs> hey, why the fuck is the gas so hot? Yeah. I believe in the sand beneath my toes. The beach gives a feeling and nothing feeling. I believe in the faith that grows. Consumer prices are still on the rise, up 8.2% year over year. The price you're paying at the supermarket has risen 13%. Medical care, 6.5%. And electric and gas bills, 15 to 33%. But if we're heading into a, a recession, it'll be the weirdest downturn that many of us have, have ever seen. That's because the job market is still strong. This economy is a head scratcher for many economists. <laughs> you serious? Because of my economic plan, we are better positioned than any other major economy in the world. Democrats are working to bring down the cost of things and to talk about around the kitchen table. Prescription drugs, to health insurance, to energy bills, and so much more. Republicans are campaigning every day on an agenda to raise your cost. They want to repeal the Inflation Reduction Act. Savings on health care premiums, average of $400 a person, gone. Savings on your utility bills, gone. Republican wins, inflation is going to get worse. It's that simple. I doubt it. You are fake news. Let's go, Brandon. Come on, man. Very fake news. You've been waiting for this. I'm going to punch him out. I'm going to go to jail. I'm going to be happy. Shut up, bitch. All right. America, go to the YouTube right now. Big ups to Rebecca for keeping Matt woke. Congratulations to both of you. You're awesome. Do it live. I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live. Hello and welcome to the show. It is a great show. It is a terrific show. It is a tremendous show. Frankly, the very best. You can ask anyone about that. People often do, I'm told. This is the Matt and Blonde Show. My name is Matt Christensen. I'm flanked on my right, as always, by my wonderful co-host, Blonde. Welcome. Hi. Well, it is a big week for yours truly. Tomorrow is my second wedding anniversary. So happy anniversary to my lovely wife. And Tuesday, (laughs) Tuesday is, how about is this gay? Tuesday is my 35th birthday, which I believe officially qualifies me for the title of middle-aged. Though I did look that up before the the start of the show. The technical definition is 45 to 65. Okay, are you going to live to be 120? Yeah, that doesn't make sense. If the average man lives to his 70s, I'm right there at the halfway point. So well, let's give us another five years. All right. Five. I get to extend this until I'm 40, until I'm middle middle age. That seems like a fair compromise, but uh, plenty of greater importance to talk about tonight. Besides my own reflections earlier this afternoon, uh, Ryan and Ian Petty joined us. Ryan is the father and Ian is the brother of Elena Petty. Uh, Elena Petty was killed in the Parkland school shooting, so we will get their reaction to the jury decision to sentence the shooter to life in prison and not to death earlier this week and how the family uh, is handling that. We will get to that mid show. Uh, Other topics for discussion tonight. Uh, A Connecticut jury awards the Sandy Hook families a billion Alex Jones bucks, or at least almost a billion Alex Jones bucks for defamation. Are there even a billion Alex Jones bucks in existence? We will discuss. Uh, Inflation remains red hot while Biden and his uh, media propagandists deny it. The January 6th committee subpoenas Trump and Nancy Pelosi, apparently on January 6th with her full production crew following her, said she wanted to punch Trump on that fateful day. So political violence is cool again. But I suppose political violence of a certain persuasion never went out of style. Among well, the I think this is awesome. Community. I want to see frail Nancy Pelosi try to punch Trump in the face. Uh, just so tell great. me how much I need to pay to see it on yeah, paper. Oh, yeah. A thousand dollars. The dollar's worth nothing anymore. I want to see that show. <laughs> yeah. uh, speaking of, well, shows to watch. John Fetterman struggles through a TV interview and you're ableist if you noticed. So, you know, don't you're not allowed to say anything about 
uh, whether or not this man is actually capable of serving as a U.S. senator, which um, given the clown world implications, I'm convinced he will be your next senator from Pennsylvania. The clown yeah. show must complete. He will he will be sitting in that seat come January. And uh, before we get out of here, a uh, we have hoax hate, of course, and tonight's movie review is The Truman Show. So stick around. We'll catch up with your super chats in between topics as usual. Ten bucks and up on the Sunday show because we are no good. Low down and money grabbers. It will be all this and more in your favorite couple hours of listening material. Remember, you can find everything show related and support the show for as little as a buck a month over on the website. That is mattchristensenmedia.com. We also have show merchandise for sale on the site. Plus, we have offers from friendly listener-owned businesses as well. This week's feature business is our friends at Western Razor Company. Everyone knows how many options there are out there for shaving products, but they all seem like they come with huge compromises. Most razors sold today are made in China by global conglomerates that hate you. Well, not anymore. I'm talking about the new high noon safety razor from Western Razor. Not only is it made in America, but it uses widely available double edged razor blades that only cost pennies each. Safety razors were used by just about every man in America back in the 50s and the 60s until the big razor companies figured out they could make more money selling disposables and signing you up for endless subscriptions. But the safety razor has always been the superior method made out of 100% metal in the USA. Western Razor's high noon razor is a fantastic way to buy American and actually save money long term. So get one today. You can get 10% off your entire order from Western Razor using promo code MAT10. That's 10% off at Western Razor, promo code MAT10. Find everything you need from Western Razor, plus other great offers from the rest of our friendly listener-owned businesses, including Hero Soap Company, Phoenix Ammunition, Snore and Defense Technologies, and more. That's at mattchristensenmedia.com slash deals. Deals by listeners for listeners. Well, uh, one brief announcement here. If, you, uh, if you're a listener of the show, in the audio format, or perhaps you listen to the video show commonly, but uh, you'd like to have an audio format for when you're on the go or where, whenever else you might just like to listen. Uh, the show is now available. The audio that is on Amazon and audible. So the clock is also started on how long it takes for us to get banned on Amazon <laughs> and audible, but Amazon and audible sent me an email this week. and said, Hey, we want your show up on Amazon. I said, sure. If people want to listen on Amazon, Go right ahead. So the, the audio feed is What now, is it? What do I have to do to uh, get this show banned? Apparently Jeff Bezos is a big fan and wanted mm. to host. But if you if that is a place where you listen to podcasts and music, you can get the show there. Uh, as a reminder, if you would like an audio feeds of the show, but maybe you don't want the Jeff Bezos controlled or at least formerly controlled. Is he still in charge? I forget. Anyway. I don't think so. Yeah. Well, Perhaps whatever audio feed you may want, uh, you can find all of those over on the podcast page of the website. That's mattchristensenmedia.com slash podcast, wherever you find audio shows, you can most likely find our show. Well, lots of news this week as usual, but this is the top story of the week. Biden has crept on yet another unsuspecting teen girl. Biden was at an event at uh, Irvine Community College in Southern California, and during a photo op, he put his hands on the girl's shoulders and he told her not to have any serious boyfriends until she's 30. I'll let you go. Look at Dan. Now, the very important thing I told my daughter and granddaughters, no serious guys in your 30s. Okay. Right? <laughs> no what? No serious guys in your 30s. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Okay. At least these women are delusional. What do you mean at least? I believe that was her mom too who said that. If I'm not mistaken. He's like no serious guys until you're 30 because I'm going to rape you until you're uh, 25. <laughs> Although you may disagree with the advice of the mom there, but in the panic of the moment, I you would say just about anything. Sure, I agree with you. Please let go of my daughter now. But the follow-up question is why would you put your daughter in the vicinity of this man in the first place? Did you see that girl's face? She's like <laughs> well let me see what uh, frame do i have up here oh uh, you can't really see it too well but you got you got the biden lean in and the hand on the shoulder i don't know anyway. creepy old man stuff well 
you tell me, perhaps that wasn't even the most awkward thing Biden said this week, because remember, you know, no matter how rough you may have it, no matter how tough the economy gets, no matter what loss you may suffer in your life, never forget about Joe's son, Bo, who died of brain cancer in 2015. Oh, what's that? 13 soldiers and Marines were killed by a bomber at the Kabul airport. Well, Joe knows exactly what that's like because of Bo. At least that's the last time I've heard a significant Bo reference. So maybe he's laid off the Bo talk recently, but he never fully does. Bo, as you'll recall, was a JAG officer in the army. Uh, in other words, he was an army lawyer. Bo was deployed to Iraq in 2008 and 2009, and he died from brain cancer in 2015. But according to Joe, giving a speech this week in Colorado, Bo actually lost his life in Iraq now. I say this as a father of a man who won the Broad Star, the Conspicuous Service Medal, and lost his life in Iraq. Imagine the courage, the daring, and the genuine sacrifice, genuine sacrifice they all made. Okay. In this context, he, he was talking that with about... a lot of confidence. He was talking about, uh, when he says the sacrifice they all made, he was talking about the 10th Mountain Division in World War II. So again, he's talking about historical examples of combat deaths and then referencing Bo. And I have no disrespect for Bo's service, but in the context of Kabul or in the context of World War II, Bo is not a combat death. Right. Bo died of brain cancer several years after coming back from Iraq. Now, Biden says has said before that it, possible exposure to burn pits either worsened or caused his cancer, which I know How is the case. How could possibly know that? Well, I know that we just that big bill was just passed. I know there are a lot of guys who have lingering health problems because of burn pit exposure. I've also seen no evidence that Bo Biden was working anywhere close to a burn pit during the, his time yeah, in the Iraq. The people that are, were getting burn pit exposures were the people that it was their job to man the burn pits. Yes. And often when you were manning a burn pit, they were just burning documents. And that's why they had to be manned. Hmm. So those people had arguably some of like the least serious exposures. Was Bo in charge of burning his dad's documents or Hunter's documents? Maybe yeah, that's really. how. This, and tires. And that's how this happened. Yeah. So th this is this is an entirely new iteration of the claim. This is not my son died in a, in a with a tangential relationship to his service in Iraq. My son right. died in Iraq. Yeah. Is yeah. what he just said. And I've not seen any statement of clarification from the White House is another example of them just allowing Joe to say loony things and not uh, addressing or correcting it later. Anyway, uh, hey, what was your favorite heckling this week? Was it there was uh, some, I, I like this? I like this Muslim heckling. I would give the Muslims the edge, but this heckling of AOC at her town hall is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, on, on Wednesday, AOC held what looks to me like a hardly attended town hall in her district in New York. And anti-war activists interrupted to condemn her, uh, condemn her for consistently voting uh, in favor of sending aid to Ukraine and perpetuating the war toward what they believe is a uh, nuclear conflict. None of this matters unless there's a nuclear war, which you voted to send arms and weapons to Ukraine. You originally voted, you ran as an outsider, yet you've been voting to start this war in Ukraine. Why are you playing with the lives of American citizens? There will be no neighbors if there's a nuclear bomb. You voted to mobilize and send money to Ukrainian Nazis. You're a coward. You're a progressive socialist. Where are you against the war mobilization? You are the establishment and you are the reason why everybody will end up in a nuclear war. Why not right now? You're the liar here. Nobody has hold you accountable. I kind of hate everyone here. Uh, go on. Well, on the one hand, I, I like her being dressed down by a visible minority about her stance on war. That scratches an itch in me. Okay. But also, um, I don't know. I mean, I, these people don't really seem like they know what they're talking about, and she doesn't know what she's talking about. So it's kind of just dumb people yelling at dumb people. But I do like to see her embarrassed. Don't you have a little bit of that let them fight appreciation? I guess that's what you were getting at. It's like, I don't have to like anybody so. involved to uh, yeah. enjoy the spectacle. 
But they were just but, yelling at her. But it, it, I do appreciate that it's showing everybody that if you are a visible minority, like you really can take these people down a notch. If he were, if if that guy was white, she would have been fighting back. A lot uh, and her her claim of victimization would have been more credible, no mm, doubt. Yeah. I, I she actually has just not even responded to this as far as I've seen publicly. Um, perhaps for that reason or reasons related to that. But I will remind AOC who said in that interaction, you're being rude. Excuse me. You're being rude. Well, I seem to remember you endorsing rudeness. The the famous tweet from December, 2020. Well, the whole point of protest is to make people uncomfortable. So if you were made uncomfortable by the rudeness, well, that is the, the standard you endorsed Miss Cortez. So, uh, yeah, live by that standard, die by that standard. I had to uh, read a whole week of her tweets today to see if she had um, publicly commented on this. Oh, God. <laughs> Do you know she has almost 14 million Twitter followers? Uh, that sounds low to me. I thought it, what? She, she's that's the joke is uh, is, you know, usually when you see a congressperson's title or name, it said it would say Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez D and Y. But in her case, it's D Twitter. Or, you know, mm. D social. She represents social media is the joke. Mm. But. Uh, yeah, well, and and it's, she's got a very active following, too. Those are uh, strongly interacted with tweets, but she's accostingly dumb, though. I was reading her Twitter today. I was like, 14 million people are showing up to read this. Some of them must hate her. Clearly, oh, there's probably a lot of hate follows. Mm. Uh, a lot of um, equine enthusiasts who want to get a. Want to get a view of those chompers, perhaps? Yeah, really. But you didn't see anything when you uh, perused these tweets. You didn't see anything in response to this particular event. No, I mean, why would she address it? Yeah, I guess it's a lose-lose. There's nothing she can do. Well, uh, I mentioned the Dearborn Muslims v. School Board conflict. God, so I love Muslims. I was I was so wrong. Well, maybe, you, you know, you're talking about your dissatisfaction with North Idaho. Perhaps you will find a home in Dearborn, Michigan, where it is roughly <laughs> 50% Arab slash Muslim. <laughs> What's the other 50%? I don't know. I don't, I just know that that's, uh, 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 I don't, Arabs and Muslims aren't uh, a majority, but they're just about there in Dearborn. No, so no. You if have, I'm going to do it, I'm going full Saudi Arabia here. You're, you're just going straight there. All right. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so, so Dearborn is a, a heavily Muslim place. And then you have the progressives of the school board and they're now clashing with this community's moral sensibilities. Hundreds of protesters attended Monday's school board meeting in protest of sexually explicit pro LGBT books in the school library. And because that protest got too rowdy, the board ended the Monday meeting. And then the board held another meeting on Thursday. (laughs) The room was packed once again and parents and protesters were again, disruptive and rowdy. One guy, is he in this article? I think he is. Yeah, he has a sign on the left hand side here. Might be tough to read on the screen because the print is small. But it says adultery, big sin, homosexuality, big sin. (laughs) I (laughs) love it. No punctuation, (laughs) just homosexuality, big sin. There he is. Uh, Uh, And and at this meeting on Thursday, actually, some community members, some of which or some of whom were uh, were gay and or transgender spoke, including a local gay man who accused the parents and protesters again 50 percent muslim roughly accused them of hating gay people and they booed him and jeered him check this out use words like pedophile to describe gay people who use words like sexual perversion to describe gay people you're not trying to ban a book. You're trying to ban gay people. Let's Based. talk about what this really is. You hate gay people. And it's obvious, because look at how you behave when one gay person speaks. Look at how you act. And your children you guys- are watching. Well- And there's future blonde throwing tomatoes from the audience. Well, I mean, what does this homo expect? It's like if you were in any of their countries, they'd be throwing you off a building. And he's like, oh, no, they're booing me. It's like, <laughs> do, you, well, do you not understand? At least the gay community is getting it, like how Muslims treat them. They're going to have to 
uh, separate this unholy alliance. And then Muslims can ban with uh, Christian conservatives. <laughs> Speaking of unholy alliances, you'll probably have some conflicts there, too. Mm, but later, we'll deal with them later. Well, and here, here's the thing about the, about this uh, this gay activist, too. He gets up there and says, it's totally unfair for you to accuse us of going after your kids. You use language like calling us calling me a pedophile or something like that. Well, but are also you a pedophile, yeah. your children are watching you. It, what's the implication there? Yeah, that that they can't actually teach their children well themselves, that they need someone like him to teach their children. Yeah. Either you're in this for their children or you're not. I understand. I, I have no evidence to say that this guy has done anything to target anyone's kids in particular. So I don't want to be. Uh, no, he's un- a confirmed pedophile. <laughs> he, maybe he is. I, for all the hypocrisies here, maybe he actually is on the sex offender registry. I, I guess I wouldn't be surprised to learn that, though. I have no evidence to that effect. If anyone wants to consider a defamation suit in pursuit of that claim. But I mean, what did, what did these people expect, though? Well, yeah, you're shocked. Like, I, all I want to do is propagandize your kids. And if you don't allow me to do that, you're a bigot. Well, that's not going to work. And he Good was telling them, that. like, your kids are watching you like they're going to learn from you. And the, all yeah. these Muslim parents are like, yeah, I mean, what do you what do you expect? Yeah. According to reporting, I didn't see this in the clips that I saw, but the crowd also booed the mention of Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. I believe this is her district, really? if I'm uh-huh. not mistaken. Okay. Uh, either that or she represents a district in Michigan close by, but I think this is uh, her district. Anyway. Come on, can't uh, Muslims and and people on the right get together so we can stop all this trans homo nonsense with the kids? It's like number one issue for so many people. Yeah, but the alliance, I don't know, man, alliance with the Muslims is a difficult pill for me to swallow. It doesn't need to be a perpetual alliance. We can go back to, you know, fighting whatever war we're fighting with them when we're done dealing with this tranny nonsense. All right. All right, I'll listen. I'll listen because, uh, well, the the world that is trying to be built otherwise is is unacceptable. Not that uh, the Islamo fascist world is is much more appealing to me, but uh, well, if I had to pick between Islamo fascist or rainbow fascist, hand I'm me the turban, man. I'm go- hand yeah. me the turban. <laughs> yeah, you know, I had a revelation the other day because I always talk about how um, hyper individualism is what got us in this mess, but it's not true. Men need to be hyper individualistic, ah. but to women, freedom is slavery. Ooh. So we need to be subjugated. That's really what this is about. So it is about freedom. It's all about freedom. Mm. But the women need to be subjugated to experience their form of freedom. Maybe that, women in, in the in the Middle East are the freest of all. There, there is an interesting philosophical debate there, as in. Not only is how we, how freedom is valued differently between men and women, but how it is actually achieved or experienced. That's yeah. uh, that's something to think about. But exactly. But if 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 satisfaction in your life is is a way to achieve that freedom, there's no doubt that men need women and women need men to experience that satisfaction and achieve it. So that's right. Uh, mess with gender roles, you will get dysfunction, unhappiness, destruction. I have no doubt about that. That's uh, fundamentally important, but. Anyway, uh, moving on to uh, one more story before we uh, talk about Alex Jones and the defamation judgment. Uh, Janine Small is a Pfizer executive, and she appeared before an EU COVID-19 meeting. uh, And Dutch politician Rob Roos, or Roos, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, but he asked her if Pfizer ever even tested the vaccine's effects on transmission before bringing the vaccine to market. Yes or no, he asked. And uh, Small responded definitively, no. Was the Pfizer COVID vaccine tested on stopping the transmission of the virus before it entered the market? I really want a straight answer, yes or no. Regarding the question around, um, did we know about stopping humanization before um, it entered the market? No, uh, these, um, you know, we had to really move at the speed of science to really understand what no, is taking didn't. place in the market. The speed of science. We what does to- that even mean? You know, she prepped that some marketing company told her to say that before this hearing. Well, it's 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 follow the science, but also the science moves so fast that you can't possibly follow it. It's a really difficult situation. Um, and of course, uh, Speaking of the speed of science, the fact checkers moved at the speed of science to uh, do some damage control on this statement. So the AP's fact check here, this isn't a revelation, actually. Nothing new was revealed. 
Pfizer, according to the AP, never actually claimed to have studied transmission before uh, releasing the vaccine. Well, what was the point of this then? (laughs) There were claims. There were, in fact, direct claims, and there were claims by implication too. They they did they did in fact say it um, prevented transmission uh, a lot, and their claims to that effect. If they don't say we studied it, it has there's at least an implication that we had some basis to make that observation. Here's Pfizer CEO Albert Borla uh, saying that it's effective against transmission in a TV interview. A lot of indications right now that uh, are telling us that there is uh, uh, a protection against uh, transmission of the disease. Well, how did you reach that conclusion without studying it? Because they never studied it. (laughs) Here's Albert Borla tweeting in June of last year. Data shows that the vaccine helps stop transmission. And that, again, implies some sort of studying, some sort of data points to reach that conclusion. But most importantly, even if we want to grant this specific point, well, they never actually did a specific peer reviewed study to that effect before the release of the vaccine. Okay, fine. You want to get super technical. But if that's true, if there was no basis to to make this claim that there was a positive effect in reducing transmission, then on what basis did we have all of these mandates to try to force people to consume the product? The entire idea was how do your part protect other people if if you aren't protecting other people from transmission if it's purely for you to reduce your own the severity of your own experience with the virus well then it is strictly a you decision and there's no basis to force anybody to take this because there's no external effect on anybody else but once again they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna tell us they were lying the whole time and then if we notice they'll just laugh at us and deny it even though we can point to all of these instances in which they told the lie and the fact checkers, rather than standing up for the American citizen and consumer will uh, get right in line for big pharma. Mm. Speaking of standing up for big pharma, uh, is this a gaffe? I, I, I get yes. it is like in context it is, but is it because this is from what I gather, I am not, I've not followed the political career of Minnesota Congresswoman Angie Craig very closely, but I gather she was in favor of forcing this, mandating that, supporting Pfizer's every whim. I I, I don't want to overstate my familiarity with her perspective, but I gather she supported some version of those things. Well, she had a debate. This is Minnesota's second congressional district. Uh, She had a debate with her challenger on Thursday, and she said, I will never stop standing up for big pharma and against my constituents. I will never stop standing up for big pharma and standing against my constituents. Thank you. Okay. Now, in context, she was talking about how big oil and big pharma fund her challenger. That's her accusation. I don't know the truth of that accusation or not. So it was an apparent misspeak in the context of what she was saying. But I have not seen any clarification. You tell me she has said nothing to correct this. Would you? No. And I had to go through her Twitter also to find out that she's like a really gross dyke and her and her her (laughs) wife. I I, I don't know why I'm so naive. I was like, her husband's name is Cheryl. (laughs) And then I go to her Twitter. I was like, ew. Yeah. Four sons, that couple. (sighs) Her husband's name is Cheryl. Shut up. Yeah. I know. Silly woman. All right. She doesn't uh, look like a dyke, though. I mean, her wife does. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I, I, it was news to me. I, like I said, I'm not familiar with her career or personal life. But <gasps> and I, then one of her first tweets was like, and now under fives can get the confidence that they need to escape COVID with the booster vaccine. Oh, wow. Like last week. Like, so you're yeah, everyone's rushing out dyke. to do that. Awesome. Yeah, really. <laughs> well, hey, speaking of defamation. <laughs> God. tell me more about alex jones yeah uh on wednesday the jury in one of what what are now uh, remember several defamation cases against alex jones returned a judgment for parents of sandy uh for parents of uh, the sandy hook school shooting and one fbi agent first responder for defaming them by saying that the shooting was a hoax uh and it, it's as if this is dr evil from austin powers uh, and, and if I, I've actually watched the uh, the judgment being read, it took almost a half hour to read all the individual judgments. 
The jury determined that Alex Jones is liable for a collective one billion dollars to the group. I think technically the number is nine hundred and sixty five million. But Alex Jones was also found liable for a forty nine million dollar judgment in a separate Texas case in August. So that does put his total liability over the billion dollar mark now, if my math is correct. So uh, recall that uh, Jones was found liable by uh, by default. Because according to the judge, he did not sufficiently participate in discovery. In other words, he withheld records and information, uh, according to the court's assessment. And of course, it's unlikely that this billion dollars is ever going to be paid out. Jones has said he plans to appeal. The parties will have to negotiate uh, what he does have to pay. And according to Jones, he has nothing close to that amount of money. Anyway, he says uh, between his own personal assets and his business, he has about a $5 million net worth. Here is Alex Jones reacting to this judgment. I personally, in my bank account, have a million and a half dollars. My company has less than a million dollars in it, barely enough to pay payroll. I've never claimed I've got all this money. They literally got up there and lied and told them I have hundreds of millions of dollars. This is a joke. It, it, it's like if I have three gallons of blood in my body or two gallons, they want 500 gallons. So it, it is a joke. We're about to file like next week that I'm worth less than about $5 million total. So this is a big, 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 big deal because I don't have the money. But what it signifies is they're coming after everybody else. Now, yeah, they just want him to file for bankruptcy. That's really what this is about. This is totally punitive. They never really wanted any money. They haven't even reached the punitive stage, too. They they still have a, 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 a judgment to be made on punitive damages, I believe. So I'm not here to rehash Alex Jones's defamation guilt or not. I went over that with Robert Barnes about six weeks ago, whether there were whether the statements were specific enough to clear the defamation threshold, whether Alex Jones was given a fair process for the purposes of this discussion, though, let's just assume uh, that Alex Jones is guilty of defamation, that he said yeah. he made legally defamatory statements. OK, the idea that a billion dollars in damages w- was done by Alex Jones's statements is absurd. OK, for perspective mm-hmm. in 2015, and I know this is not an apples to apples comparison necessarily. It depends on what the, what sort of assets the parties have. But consider this in 2015, the Sandy Hook families got a collective $1.5 million settlement from the Lanza estate. In other words, the money that Adam yeah. Lanza, the killer's mom had. So again, many variables in play here, but am I supposed to believe that what Alex Jones said about Sandy Hook is something like 700 times more damaging than the <laughs> yeah. shooting itself? Mm-hmm. I guess yeah. that's what we're going with. And and even if you do think that Alex Jones is liable, and I know even uh, among you know non-leftists, conservatives, libertarians, whatever, I've seen a lot of good faith disagreement about whether Alex Jones is in fact guilty or not. And I'm I'm not here to tell you that you're wrong if you think that Alex Jones did make legally defamatory statements. But even if you think that's the case, and you think that a, a billion dollars is somehow a legitimate and serious penalty, understand that this model is being uh, and and will be politically weaponized yeah in a twitter video in response to this judgment former labor uh, labor secretary robert reich argued for using these jones lawsuits as a model not for getting justice for the victims of defamation as defined by law and within appropriate first amendment constraints no this is just a model to eliminate political opponents there actually might be a way to stop the constant stream of lies coming from the right-wing media. How can we do it? Two words. Sue them. Now, this won't defeat the rights media ecosystem overnight, but defamation law may prove to be one vital weapon in the battle against misinformation. This defamation lawsuit will serve as a warning to both Jones and others in the media who build their business models around spreading lies. Like OAN, Fox News, defamation litigation will not single-handedly stop the rampant spread of misinformation taking over the airwaves and the internet. (gasps) But at a time when social media companies clearly cannot be trusted to moderate themselves, the courts might be the best avenue we have to take on manufactured deception and put it to rest. Two can play at this game, though. You guys want to go down this road? I guess we're going to have defamation wars. Yeah. 
What and, happens when this comes back on the SPLC media matters? Yeah. And, and don't misunderstand me. I, you know, I know we've talked about defamation in the context of Kyle Rittenhouse or uh, the Covington kids. This is not me saying that all defamation, the entire standard ought to be erased, but it is me saying that defamation as a legal concept is about bringing justice to a specific person who is victimized. That is yeah. not what Robert Reich is talking about here at all. He's just mm-hmm. saying, if you lie, Again, in lies determined by his judgment. If you lie in general, we ought to be able to destroy you. Yeah. He, he, he uses the word weaponize in the video. Hey, here's something we can weaponize to punish our opposition. He's not saying, hey, here's a legal standard that's supposed to protect everybody equally. No, no. Here's a standard we can weaponize against our enemies. Yep. And notice the subtlety. Again, uh, here's how we punish people for lies. That is not what defamation law does, strictly speaking. A lie is a component of it, but it has to be a lie that damages damages. a specific person. You have to be able to demonstrate those damages. That's why if I go out, if I do a stream about how the sky is green, I tell you, you're all idiots. The sky is green. There's no defamation implication there, even though objectively I'd be lying. You can, you can, but you can't come after me legally. Now, if I made a defamatory statement about you specifically and I said X, Y and Z and it caused you to be fired from your job or some other tangible damage, that's what defamation law is about. Not just lying in general. As a general rule, you do have a right to lie. Now, that doesn't mean it's moral, doesn't mean it's it's right. But if we want to create legal standards against being wrong in terms of matters of opinion, whether you're intentionally wrong or accidentally wrong, well, that that is the death of free speech at that point. Yep. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, I, I know it's I know it's cliche to 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 say that they test these things on Alex Jones and then they extend them to everybody else. And that's what Alex Jones says. That, that They come after me first. They're going to come after you next. Here's Robert Reich saying that, though. This is not that's just that's exactly what he said. Yeah. Yeah. As a punitive it, measure. It's the quiet part out loud. I, I So you have to listen to them when they say well, how else are they are they going to get their message across? Yeah, I, I just can't believe you post things that brazenly. Oh, I, I shouldn't say I can't believe that. That's I can I can entirely believe it. It, it, it. Again, it's just another mechanism to win, to destroy your enemies, not to stand up for anybody's rights or to stand up for any sort of principle. Yeah. But uh, anyway, do you have anything more to say about Alex Jones? No, I mean, this is the first of many similar cases. Yeah, we'll we'll see if they try Go after OAN. Go after Fox News. They showed Steven Crowder in there. They showed Dan Bongino. Yeah, Dan Bongino. It's just yeah. people they don't like. All right. Um, before we get to the interview with uh, Ryan and Ian Petty, I do want to give some context for what happened this week in, uh, at the uh, at the sentencing for uh, the Parkland uh, shooter, Nicholas Cruz. Uh, Cruz, of course, killed 17 in that February 2018 shooting. Last year, he pleaded guilty to 17 counts of murder and 17 counts of attempted murder. So what was going on here was not an assessment of his guilt that's already been established. This is a determination of what sentence he should face. So the options were uh, life in prison without parole or the death penalty. Now, Mm -hmm. under Florida law, the death penalty can only be applied by a unanimous jury decision. And in the case of a life in prison recommendation, which is what the jury reached in this case, my understanding is... Uh, and I'm not 100% sure on this, so correct me if I'm wrong, uh, chat viewers. But if the jury reaches a life in prison recommendation, the judge generally cannot change that. That is set. He will be formally sentenced to that uh, sentence in uh, next month. Uh, now, as far as far as why, as far as why the jury opted for uh, the life in prison sentence and not the death penalty, again, it would have taken everyone on the jury to reach the death penalty sentence. Uh, The jury considered aggravating factors uh, of the crime presented by the prosecutors against mitigating factors presented by the defense. So the aggravating factors included the cruel and premeditated nature of the crime, the risk of death to many people, and the disruption of government function at the school. The defense presented 41 mitigating factors, emphasis on Cruz's uh, prenatal alcohol exposure. In other words, his mom did drugs and drank when he was uh, in utero. And that Cruz's adoptive mother apparently did not provide necessary treatment. So the jury could not reach agreement on a death sentence. Uh, Reportedly three 
jurors were holdouts. So you they were stuck at 9-3, 9 in favor of the death penalty, 3 in favor of life. And if they can't reach an agreement, then they just have to come out and give a recommendation for life. The jury deliberated only on Tuesday. They slept on it Tuesday night and um, returned their decision Tuesday morning. So that is the context for the interview. Did you have anything that you wanted to say before we get into that interview? Uh, no, I mean, there's just such a nice family. It's so tragic. It, it obviously it's tragic when this happens to anybody, but it's like, oh God, it's always the, the nicest, best people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that context, we will get to our interview with, uh, Ryan and Ian Petty. Again, the father of, uh, the father and brother of Elena Petty, who, uh, was killed that day. The interview is about 18 minutes long, so we will catch up with you on the other side of it. And welcome back. We are pleased to host our guests for the evening. Ryan Petty is the father of Elena Petty. Ian is his son and Elena's brother. Elena was tragically lost in the 2018 shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Ryan is also a uh, safety and Second Amendment advocate. And in 2020, Governor Ron DeSantis appointed Ryan to the Florida Board of Education. You can find Ryan at RyanPetty.com. Ian is a father of two himself with two more on the way. Uh, congratulations. And it is a pleasure to host both of you. Thanks for making time for us. Thanks for having us. It's great to be with you. Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, on Thursday morning, obviously, the jury returned its recommended sentence for Parkland uh, for the Parkland shooter, uh, life in prison, and uh, not the death penalty, which was the other option. Now, according to Florida law, that is the sentence that the shooter will now formally receive next month. What are your thoughts in reaction to the sentence? Well, uh, I think we were stunned as a you know group of families. We've um, been through this now four year, eight month process to try to get um, to justice, to try to see justice served for the for the killer of 17 wounded 17 others. And we get, um, we get to, uh, the verdict and, uh, the jurors in, in, in Broward, and I'm sure we'll get into the details But the jurors in Broward County found, you know, with the, the state had proved all of the aggregating factors in the case of the, of the kids that were killed, there were five aggravators in the case of the, the adults that were killed, there were seven aggravators. Uh, they found, unanimously uh, that all of the aggravators had been proven without a reasonable doubt by the state and found him unanimously eligible for the death penalty. But uh, we learned later there was one juror in particular that um, was adamantly going to vote for life in prison. And uh, two other jurors we've now learned uh, followed, I guess, the lead of that juror and we ended up with what we believe is a nine to three, nine to three decision for life in prison. So very, um, you know, mixed feelings about uh, the death penalty in general. But if there was ever a case where the death penalty was warranted and that certainly, uh, you know, allowed uh, as a penalty in the state of Florida, we thought this was the case. And just I think I think most of the families are devastated that. Uh, that uh, and don't see this verdict as just mm. Mm. you yeah. uh, uh sorry did you have more thoughts ian no uh just gonna say 100 percent uh agree i think when they only deliberated i think for like eight hours total and so my thought was they're ready thursday morning we might actually get you know the verdict that we were expecting which was the death penalty um but I guess it was pretty tense in, in the jury room from, from what we've heard in, in terms of a lot of back and forth and really a lot of fighting. So 
you know, I mean, uh, unfortunately it didn't, it didn't end up the way we were expecting, but, um, definitely not an easy deliberation process. I don't think at all. I've even seen an allegation of a threat made to, I'm not sure which juror, but is, is that your impression that maybe there was, they, they stopped due to conflict rather than just an inability to reach unanimity. They just yeah. were at each other's throats and stopped or something like that. Yeah. We heard that um, as we were sitting in the courtroom, waiting for the jury to, to enter it, the, the judge was waiting for one or two of the family members who were traveling, you know, to, uh, to get to the court courthouse. The jurors were literally begging the bailiff to come in because they were tired of being in the jury room together. Um, there, you're absolutely right. There's, we understand now an allegation of a threat that the sheriff's office is investigating. We'll see what the outcome of that is, but almost immediately after the verdict was announced, we were sitting with the state attorneys who had prosecuted the case. And they shared with me that um, one of the jurors had written a letter to the judge and that was being entered into the court record. That juror sort of like, out of the blue, wrote to the judge and said, there, there are some allegations from other jurors that I was not ever going to vote for the death penalty. That's not true. And she was sort of attempting to set the record straight or something preemptively, which was very, very strange, we thought. So that, that letter showed up just almost an hour, maybe after the verdict was read. Hmm. And then we subsequently learned about a possible threat the sheriff's office is investigating. We'll see what comes of it. All of that said, it's unlikely the judge will set aside the the verdict of the jury and do anything other than what you know was announced in the court that day. So her letter suggested that she wasn't broadly opposed to the death penalty, that she had made some sort of specific decision based on this case. Yeah, she claimed in the letter that she was unbiased and open-minded and and as she had been asked um, during jury selection process that she was open to the death penalty, uh, which all jurors had to be open to that possibility right. or they were, um, excluded from the jury pool. Um, she claims that she in fact did not perjure herself at that point. Um, I think the allegations and the commentary we've heard from the foreman was that may- maybe that wasn't entirely true because she came to her decision for life very quickly was adamant, wouldn't really engage with the other jurors, or at least that's what we suspect. And so there's some doubt as to whether or not she was truthful at the beginning. I don't know that any of it will matter. She only would have written that letter in in reaction to perjury allegations. Yeah, which she alluded to in the beginning of her letter, saying that there are some other jurors that, that are claiming that I, you know, Mm. Uh, was not open to the death penalty. And then she tries to defend herself preemptively. But it's very odd that she would send the judge a letter uh, when no official allegations had been made. They were Mm. probably incoming. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I don't think the foreman had even said, had been interviewed or anything at that point. Um, It was really just her saying, hey, you know, uh, they had, uh, they accused me of, of potentially, or of hearing me state that I was a hard no to the death penalty uh, to another juror um, who maybe she felt like was in her camp or something like that. Okay. Um, and so that's when it kind of, I think, got really heated there. Well, I'd like to talk to you guys about moving on both from a policy perspective and just from a personal perspective. And as far as policy lessons or potential things to fix, uh, in the aftermath of this, uh, Ryan, I saw you tweeting in some of your response that, that we need criminal sentencing reform in Florida. Uh, can you explain a little bit about what you think the problem is and what changes you'd like to see? Yeah, so I'll give you my basic understanding of where we're at right now. And I've spoken with the governor's team about this and, and Governor Santos has talked about this pretty openly. In fact, um, I, I mentioned uh, earlier that uh, I was supposed to go uh, uh, do a rally for the governor uh, down in Broward County this morning, but I was uh, injured the other day in an accident. And so I, I wasn't able to travel down there and be with him and talk to him directly about this. But I think what we're going to work on is, you know, at, at some point in the past, and hopefully I'll have my sequencing correct, 
uh, a lot of judges in Florida were setting aside jury verdicts uh, and in imposing the death penalty. And I think there was a case that was brought before the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, hey, you can't do that. Uh, the Florida Supreme Court at that time uh, was a was a quite liberal Supreme Court, and they essentially forced this unanimous um, sentencing verdict rule uh, on Florida court. So right now, obviously, to be convicted in the guilt phase of a trial, uh, particularly uh, you know a murder case, you're you know it's it's a unanimous jury for conviction of guilt. That's okay. I, I, I have no issue with that. Uh, that's how our system works. And that uh, that high bar, I think, is important to protect the citizens from the state. But on the sentencing phase, where, where guilt has already been established, it also requires, the death penalty requires a, a unanimous um, vote by the jury. So what we're going to look into next legislative session in Florida is, should that be different? Should it be a simple majority? Should it be a supermajority? Should it be something like a nine to three vote, which in this case still would have uh, ended up with a uh, a verdict of uh, uh, capital punishment? So we'll look into that. Um, obviously, I think there should be a fairly high bar just generally for these kinds of, of cases. Uh, I know a lot of folks are um, concerned about the death penalty. That's understandable. But, you know, it seems like our families have um, been victimized again by sort of the process. I mean, just from the beginning, right? The school district not handling this student, uh, this killer's disciplinary cases correctly. Um, the mental health profession and the services that were rendered to him, and we can go into this, but hundreds or thousands of hours of community counseling and mental health services were provided to the student, educational, uh, uh, services provided, law enforcement engagement, none of those entities did what they should have done. And our families suffered the ultimate loss, paid the ultimate price for their failures. And here again, it feels like the criminal justice system, you know, if you get one juror that just, for whatever reason, is, is opposed to the death penalty, but lies during jury selection, then then the death penalty can't be imposed here. And uh, I'm concerned about that. And so, you know, as a group of families, I think we'll rally together. We'll work with Governor DeSantis and the legislature and see if we can't change the law here in Florida. Hmm. Well, speaking of family, uh, back when we had Ian on after the shooting, I think that was 2018, right? It wasn't long after the shooting itself. And that interview always sticks with me. And I've discussed it with the audience and with Blonde frequently before because it was such an example of the power and the importance of family in the context of a horrific tragedy. And in your your Twitter reaction, Ryan, you, you discussed um, the importance of family in dealing with an imperfect and unjust world. And I just wonder if you guys can offer some more thoughts on how important family has been and how valuable a strong family is to this sort of experience. Yeah, I can, I can say this, look, family has, um, I don't know how I would have as an individual gotten through this tragedy without, without my family. Um, losing Elena, was absolutely the most difficult thing I've I've ever gone through. I was, um, it's hard to, I mean, no parent wants to prepare for anything like that. And I don't think I was prepared, um, certainly for, for her loss. Um, but we have, we have a very strong family. We have a belief that as a family will be reunited uh, with Elena at some point and be together. Uh, again, and we will see her again. And so that helps. Um, well, it doesn't take away the pain and the anguish and, and the feeling of loss that we've had. Um, it certainly helps us to pull together. And so, you know, sitting here with Ian and, and I've got two grandsons now, which bring a smile to my face. And, you know, as we walked out of that um, verdict, we walked over to a, an area where the families were, were together and my grandsons were there. And I, I, at no point did I feel like smiling, but I see their faces as they walk up to me and they don't know what's going on. They, they don't know why we're all there, but they see grandpa 
and they come up smiling and give me a hug. And I had a smile on my face immediately. So that's how important family is in getting through all of this. And what's interesting also about this tragedy is that there are 16 other families that we've grown close to. Um, we don't often agree on things or the solutions or how do you prevent these kinds of tragedies from happening, but it's been a strength to, uh, to see their families pull together through this and, and for us to help each other kind of get through this. So um, I just can't imagine going through anything like this alone. I just don't think I could do it. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think, uh... The hardest part for me back when I, I first, you know, spoke with you, you both was, um, you know, uh, my wife was pregnant with our first child at that time. He's four. Um, knowing he was never actually going to meet my sister here. Right. And I know she was super excited. She was talking to my wife a lot about, you know, pregnancy and ways to help her feel better. Cause she's always been really sick with, uh, every, both times she's been pregnant. Um, and even now, uh, very sick, um, with this third pregnancy. So uh, that one is one that I've, I've really struggled with is, is how do I explain that? You know, like they see the pictures, they see, um, or, or hear us talking about her. Um, we went on Friday before we came back up to where, where we live now, uh, in central Florida, um, went to, to her grave, uh, and, and just, you know, spent uh, a little time there with, uh, with my sons and, you know, it's, it's, a you know, they don't understand at all. Uh, but to just think like, you know, they, they don't get to experience her um, and, and none of the families get to experience the ones they lost anymore. Um, you know, it, it, it's obviously uh, sad, um, it, but it definitely, it, it made me angry for a long time. And, you know, I'm coming around to, to kind of figuring out how to, how to deal with that and, and not be, so angry. Um, you know, I, the, the verdict I think is whether it was the verdict or not that we wanted, um, kind of closes a chapter, so to speak. And it's just kind of the next step of, we have to choose what we're going to do with our life after that and the way we respond and, and whatnot. And so it's just battling through that and figuring that out. Well, I can't add much more of importance, uh, anything of much more importance than than that. I don't know about you, blonde, but uh, but well said, <laughs> you guys. I'm so. I'm sure you will. Uh, well, I have no doubt that you will honor Elena's memory as it deserves to be honored. Uh, and so, with that, we're we're about out of time. I uh, really appreciate you guys uh, joining and and discussing something that is obviously very difficult, but but very important as well. Um, that's Ryan and Ian Petty. You can find uh, Ryan Petty at ryanpetty.com. Uh, do you, do either of you guys have, uh, other places you'd like to send people if they'd like to view your stuff or get in touch with you or anything like that? Well, if you, if you want a good laugh, you can follow me on Twitter. <laughs> so I'm at our Petty. Sure. There's always some, uh, there's always some fun stuff, uh, that I'll post on there, but, uh, we appreciate you both taking time to talk with us today and, and uh, for helping us remember and honor Elena. Well, thanks for making time for us, uh, especially under such difficult circumstances. We hope the best for you and your family. And of course, uh, be in touch with us. Thank you. Thanks again to our guests, Ryan and Ian Petty. You can find Ryan at ryanpetty.com. And we, of course, appreciate his and Ian's openness in speaking about what is obviously a 
difficult issue. And um, what can I say? After after we were done, they got you. The, they what? they cued the waterworks, man. <laughs> yeah, that was embarrassing. I like went downstairs. I was like, uh, talked to my husband. I was like, I love you so much. <laughs> and I hope you and Emmeline know every day. Well, that is that is exactly what is of crucial importance that uh, I have no doubt Ryan and Ian agree with and uh, appreciate them offering time to us. So I uh, hope all the How best for the family. How do actual journalists do it, though? Uh, do what? What do you mean? Just like keep, keep a straight face. Oh. And I've well, seen uh, journalists cry before when interviewing uh, people, but it always seems like kind of fake or I've seen like, was it Savannah Guthrie crying about COVID? Something like well, that. See, that's the rule. The rule should be obvious to you. No chicks. Don't have chicks do interviews and you've solved that problem. No, but she was <laughs> fake crying. But oh. I never see I never see people like crying with, with with genuine sympathy with somebody that they um they're interviewing. I don't know how they do it. Maybe you just get desensitized over time, I suppose. I don't know. Hmm. Um but uh, we are due for a, a check in with our <laughs> chatters. If you want to do that, uh, let's see. I'm going to before I forget, I'm going to hop over to uh, D live. Uh, John Gulbani says, love the show. Can't wait for the movie review. I'm an architect in Seaside, Florida, where uh, it was filmed. Oh, this must be the Truman show. Uh, and Matt, Matt Gatz grew up in Truman's house. No, is that true? I didn't know that. What? I'll have to look that up. I didn't know that he's the chatter is saying that Matt Gatz grew up in Truman's house. Like, is that a real place? I thought it was all just a movie set, but is that a real house you can live in? Sounds made up. I'll have to investigate the claim. You always go to the chat for accurate reporting. Uh, thank you, John. Appreciate it. Over, uh, well, now that, never mind, not over anywhere because we have our whole integrated system. I'm pretty uh, confused about what's going on. I bought PN. Uh, no note as usual, just uh, checking in to support the show, and that is why we love I bought PN. We love you. We do. You're very special. Holden Mulray says, Hi, Truth Seekers. Apologi apologies if you've already covered this. One silver lining of the past few years, women have decided to drop out of the workforce. I would like to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, uh, That's a blonde question. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's great. One of the <clears throat> greatest travesties for gender roles was introducing women into the workforce. Um, it's been so bad for, for gender relations and to uh, create this egalitarian relationship model. You know who once wrote a book on that theme? At least something of that. Phyllis theme. Schlafly, probably. Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth really? Warren talked about how women entering the workforce created this. Uh, I think what she called it was the two income trap. Something like well, that. Well, that's definitely true. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, yeah. So, that, I think that uh, some excellent things have come out of COVID. Some like really wonderful things. It was well, a great time for my family. That's for sure. Uh, in ways, <laughs> uh, although the financial price that we're all paying now, I would say, uh, you know, that's rough, but, but some of the lessons that were learned there, there were some silver linings. I can grant that point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Holden metal rules says I have two Halloween classics for you guys to watch killer clowns from outer space and the B movie basket case. Well, thank you for those recommendations. Uh, oh, I watched that movie when I was a kid and I was so scared. Uh, I haven't killer seen either clowns. of those. I haven't seen Killer Clowns. Um, looking back, of course, we do have a special movie list of no uh, list of nominations for the last Sunday in the month. Uh, looking back, I probably should have made I probably should have done some kind of Halloween vote for the Halloween show, like Halloween movie list. I'm a dummy, so we didn't do that. But we have something else <laughs> exciting for you. Uh, we'll get to that during the movie review. Long Dong John says might not be able to watch live. So in case I don't catch it before the replay, good afternoon, good evening <laughs> and good night. I now know that reference. Thank you. Uh, you want to you read a few of these? Daniel Kunkel, the one billion dollar Alex Jones has been told to pay is insane when compared to actual harm done by other entities. Look at what Ford had to pay for torching people with the Pinto. Ford got off easy. By yeah, what was the settlement in that? I have no idea. Less than a billion dollars. <laughs> Maybe. Inflation corrected. Yeah. Um, Robin D. Banks, everyone remember to vote for Brokeback Mountain for movie review. Do God's work and make Blonde watch movie about uh, uh, with two dudes boning. Imagine her face if you need motivation. I think that uh, it's closed, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's actually over. I guess what I just have to say <laughs> to you is, are you gay? We will get to that. There's no more voting for Brokeback Mountain, okay? The voting time has expired. Maybe Brokeback Mountain will come back another day, but there will be no Brokeback viewing for the time being. I hate to break the news to you. That's really good because Heath Ledger was a sexy, sexy man. Jake Gyllenhaal I buy as a homosexual. I, I believe that. That Jack Twist, he was authentically believable. 
Mm. Uh, Darius Lupus, take my meager shekels after my medical bills. Tell peeps to wear gear. Was sent 30 feet after being hit from my blind spot on my motorcycle. Ooh. Walked away with a mere clavicle in four places. An actual lucky amount of damage. Love you guys. Wow, I'm so glad Damn. you're okay. Well, hope you're all right. Yikes. That's why bikes and motorcycles freak me. I'm, I'm not... I, I talk about my hatred of cyclists. I fear bicycles. Actually, that's part. Of, I don't want to be in a bike crash. They're too nasty. So, so you hate what you fear? Yeah, you got me. I've been exposed. No, I actually do hate their stupid tights and their helmets, but I also hate bikes. The crashes yeah. are just too gnarly. I'm with you. Robin D. Banks. Matt and I once made love. K. So no, it was in the basement of the Capitol on January 6th. I've been waiting for this moment. I exclaimed as I ran to him. And he knocked me clean out. Sad. Chivalry is dead. Chivalry is dead. I'm sorry for that encounter. Uh, Michael Mammoth. Please have Blonde say, hello, my name is Rebecca, and my pronouns are Zzer. So we can have a new sounder. Who would want that? I might have uh, ruined that one by laughing a little bit. Injured Guardian. The insult from last week's, last week's hoax hate may have been, bravo, India. Bravo, bravo, Yankee. Probably. That is, Maybe. uh, those are the, uh, what's the word for the military alphabet? You know, whiskey, tango, foxtrot. What's the yeah, word but for I that? Don't, I, I hear you, but I, but I still don't understand. Bibby. Well, it's, it's, yeah. It spells out Bibby. Is that, uh, he's saying that might've been the slur. Remember the mystery B slur yeah. that we couldn't figure out. Maybe it's Bibby. Read a couple more. I'll investigate if this counts as an anti-Indian slur. I just feel like if, if it were that offensive, I'd know it. Right. I don't know. The Mike David Smoke Show. Tonight, the clover bourbon in a perfectly prepared old-fashioned and almost Espinosa la crema. The ever-lovely Mr. Becca and our Matt almost Christian sin <laughs> delivering points of note on a perfect evening. Stay thirsty, my friends. You stay thirsty. Thank I you. like that nickname. I'm getting that Matt almost Christian sin. That's like yeah. check in weekly on Saturday nights. You can I watch have some me. moles in the Bible study, and they said they were coming along nicely. Ah, you have yeah. spies, do you? Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Well, as a reminder, if you want to check out the Bible study, either live or listening later, you can do that on the Bible study page of the website. Find the link on the homepage. Sacklog, the greatest last one for right now. You know, things were more honest in the old days, like 200 years ago when someone said my N word. They really meant my N word. <laughs> <laughs> for more deep thoughts on race and other topics, check out my YouTube channel. Sacklog, the great love of the show. We love you too. Wow. You racist bastard. The N word. You know what the N word is? Well, thank you for the chats. We will come back to your chats at the end of the show. Um, I'll have to just circle back with you. Three dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we learned, you know. Now next time I go to uh now next time I go to the Quickie Mart, I will say hello, good bipty, sir. That doesn't really make sense. But I learned that Bipti is a thing. That's a that's a that's an actual slur. I, I don't think Susan punishes it yet, though, or too ahead of the curve. Anyway, let's uh, get back into the news. Uh, how much time? I need to just make a broken record segment of the month because whenever we bring in the latest inflation report, I can't believe inflation was hotter than expected this month, but it was hotter than expected once again. I kind of hate doing this because it's just meaningless at this point. Everybody knows that they're paying more at the pump and that food is costing more. So, so do we do we do we really need to tell everybody that it's getting worse every month? Oh, I, I want to so. know the percentages. CPI rose 0.4 percent in September. I mean, that is a lot. That's it month sound to like month, a lot. right? We're That's, talking about month over month. Yeah. yeah. The year over year pace, 8.2 percent, 8.2. 0.2%. And that's down. Core, that's an improvement. Yeah, really. Yeah. Core inflation, um, which ex which excludes food and energy prices, so I think it's kind of worthless. That was 0.6% up last month, year-over-year -year gain of 6.6%. So this is the fastest core price growth since 1982. The economy was not super great back then. But here's how they're spinning it. This is some Columbia University economics professor or some shit. On paper, inflation has come down. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the elephant compared in the room to is what? price so levels. Compared to August? Compared the, to August. Oh, the, yeah. uh, the August year on year when it was yes. nine. Now we're down to yes. eight two. Now okay. we're down to eight two. Yeah. The elephant in the room is price levels are still increasing at an extremely high rate. No <laughs> shit. No <laughs> shit. You're still getting stabbed, but at a slower pace. And you yeah. should thank the murderer for that. Okay. Well, th again, I know that I, I know this is a little bit of broken record stuff, but I'm going to keep re returning to this when they keep doing this. Because whenever we get this dismal economic news, 
You get the same dismal economic mm-hmm. propaganda. I mentioned this last time from NBC when they we got the inflation report. This it's really head scratching. That's the propaganda. Ooh, term, a head scratching yeah. economy. They did another segment on Friday morning, wondering, "Hey, th- this looks bad. Might we get a recession? Is that is that possible? Could we get a recession? And if we do, if that does happen, it's going to be the weirdest downturn ever," says their expert. Because unemployment is still so good. They're recycling that same line from last month. This is uh, this is a really head scratching economy. Consumer prices are still on the rise, up eight rise, up eight point two percent year over year. The price you're paying at the supermarket has risen thirteen percent. The cost of medical care climbing six and a half percent. And electric and gas bills up 15 to 33 percent. We could be headed for a recession because the Fed keeps hiking rates so aggressively. Whenever the Fed is raising rates, the specter of the recession is always present. But if we're heading into a a recession, it'll be the weirdest downturn that many of us have, have ever seen. That's because the job market is still strong. Unemployment sitting at a more than 50 year low of three and a half percent. So they've got a lot of work to do. When will they get it under control? Could be 12 months in total. In other words, come next spring. Could be longer. We simply don't know. This economy is a head scratcher for many economists. Are you, are you guys serious? <laughs> okay. Once again, at, the, at this point, uh, re- remember had sh- how Shu Shu on head had that button for the wage gap that she would just press. I need that for this. There is nothing head scratching about inflation being the result of reducing production in the form of lockdowns, in the form of paying people to stay home yeah. while we increase the supply of dollars by printing them. You yeah, have a limited amount of goods. You've reduced the amount of goods. You have more dollars chasing the goods. Thus, it will take more dollars to pay for those goods. Okay. There's also nothing encouraging about a low unemployment rate necessarily. All that is, is a measure of people, uh, is a measure of people claiming unemployment benefits. It's not a measure of people working. It's not a measure of productivity. Every productivity measure is bad. GDP, GDI, labor force participation. They're bad. And even if you think the labor market is good, you can't walk down the street without someone throwing a job at you. Real wages have declined. In other words, the purchasing power of the money that you earn is down. They can talk about people having jobs. They can talk about wages increasing. If the money that you earn buys less stuff, you're losing money, at least the purchasing power of that money. There's nothing mysterious about any of this. I am an economic idiot. A layman can understand it. Yeah. I have no academic credentials whatsoever. (sighs) You don't have to be a genius to put this together. But of course, Biden is out there just making up nonsense, too. He uh, again, this context is is we've had months now of, of 40 year record inflation at this point. Biden gives a speech in L.A. on Thursday to celebrate the achievements of the infrastructure bill. And Joe says Democrats are saving everyone money. But if Republicans win uh, in the House and the Senate next month, Inflation will get worse. Democrats are working to bring down the cost of things and to talk about around the kitchen table, from prescription drugs to health insurance to energy bills and so much more. Republicans are campaigning every day on an agenda to raise your costs. They want to repeal the Inflation Reduction Act. Savings on health care premiums, average of $400 a person, gone. Savings on your utility bills, gone. Republican wins, inflation is going to get worse. It's that simple. They want to repeal the super awesome, very cool bill. That means things won't be super <laughs> awesome and very cool anymore. Oh my God, dude. Like, um, I, not that I'm expecting results any differently, but where is the evidence that the Inflation Reduction Act has, has reduced inflation in any way? I thought we flipped that switch. I don't think anybody's expecting it to. Hmm. Even people on the left are not. Right. And I I don't I don't mean to cheerlead for the Republican Party uh, in this case. But but how could inflation possibly get any worse in the context of 40 year highs? What are you saying? If you vote for them, you're going to get 80 year highs. Well, what are we how is it going to get worse? What are you talking about? And who the hell actually listens to this guy who looks at their wallet or looks at their bills, looks at their bank account? But then and and they worry about making ends meet. But then they listen to this guy telling them, no, no, I saved you money. Yeah. Who the hell believe? Who are these people who buy into this? I just don't think they care. I think that they think that this entire presidency is just punitive. And so all of this is just kind of taking a fall. And well, I'm fine with it. 
that is a theory that is an excellent transition to the next topic. Speaking of punitive presidencies, that's probably what we're dealing with. This entire thing is punitive in the context of January 6th and the prior administration and all of that. Well, this week, the January 6th committee had its ninth nationally televised hearing. I'm sure everyone has been tuning in this uh, apparently the final meeting of the committee before the midterm elections in which supposedly new evidence was presented. But the major headline of the hearing is at the end, the committee voted unanimously. Can you believe it? Unanimously to subpoena former President Trump, uh, of course, the target of the entire investigation. Committee chair Benny Thompson says there is historical precedent for the committee to compel uh, Trump's testimony for his part. Trump initially responded uh, that he loves the idea of testifying before the committee. This, according to sources close to the former president speaking with Fox News. Um, But in reality, that is never going to happen, either willingly or by force. Uh, Republicans Mm. will almost certainly gain control of the House in November. The Senate, a little dicier, but the House is, is all but a lock. And when the new Congress is sworn in in January, this entire committee will be immediately dead. Trump maybe personally enthused about testifying and I would like to watch the show, but I got to imagine that his lawyers will whisper in his ear. "Uh, You're not going to do that. And before January, we're going to fight this. Uh, So it's not going to happen. There, there would be, if they try to compel him, there will be legal challenge that will just run out the clock until January anyway. So what new uh, information was presented? What else did we, uh, did we learn here? Well, Adam Schiff, says that the Secret Service knew ahead of time, uh, ahead of January 6th, that is, that the attack was coming. And this is because the Secret Service was monitoring the Proud Boys. The Secret Service had advanced information more than 10 days beforehand regarding the Proud Boys planning for January 6th. We know now, of course, that the Proud Boys and others did lead the assault on our Capitol building. On December 31st, Agents circulated intelligence reports that President Trump supporters have proposed a movement to occupy Capitol Hill. Hmm. Recall previously, the FBI had a report that said there was no evidence of large scale orchestration of January 6th. Yeah. Now the whole thing was a Proud Boy op. And also the Secret Service knew about the Proud Boy op, but they didn't stop the Proud Boy op. And they opened the doors, quite literally. And that's evidence for... That's evidence that all the tinfoil hatters uh, on this story are way out of line. You guys had all the information ahead of time, didn't stop it. And we're not supposed to ask questions about why not. Uh, also, a question of note that that came out of the, this particular hearing. We got new footage through CNN and others. Nancy Pelosi, while she was running around in terror through the Capitol halls, had a whole production crew with her. This uh, through her daughter, documentarian uh, Alexandra Pelosi. So uh, professional cameras, a a professional production crew following her around. And in some of that footage, Nancy is heard saying she hopes Trump shows up at the Capitol so she can punch him out. I would come to him and punch him out. I know I would pay to see that. I'm waiting for this, for trespassing on the Capitol grounds. I'm going to punch him out and I'm going to go to jail. I'm going to be happy. Uh, In another previously unseen image released by the committee, Nancy, in fact, was ready for battle. She had her war paint and her (laughs) horns on. But it never it never came to be. Uh, Now, isn't it isn't it ironic that she was calling for harsh punishment for trespassing, which, of course, became a metaphor for the entire day? Yep. Yeah. Um, but as you mentioned earlier, you know, if, if they can't, if they can't compel, uh, compel Trump's testimony, mutual combat with Pelosi. I think that's fair <laughs> settlement. I want to see it. I, I want to see it. I, I will stop whatever I'm doing and pay whatever I need to, to see that show. But I, 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 I couldn't even gather them all, but, uh, you know, go on, go on Twitter this week and browse the blue checks. Uh, Political violence is cool again. Nancy Pelosi is a hero for wanting to exert extrajudicial violence on her political opponents. And when Trump says things like this, he is a uh, he's a fascist or a semi fascist, if you ask Joe. And but but if Nancy does this, then that's just a queen slaying whether or not the queen can in fact (laughs) slay. Really saying that. 
Well, I have some people me. say it unironically, but gross. Yeah, Trump. Trump is is always uh, a villain for possibly referencing violence or even joking about violence. Nancy was not joking there at all. I, if he comes no. here, I want to violently confront him. That's fine. Yeah. Yep. And and it, she before, was, you know, this was in jest. I actually don't really have a problem with this, but it's the hypocrisy. It's the standard. And I, I will remind you, it's the standard they set is mm -hmm. what I mean. And I will remind you the context of that clip is early in the uh, the so-called raid that day. It's it's while people are gathering outside the Capitol. Yep. So it's yeah. it's before things actually got, quote unquote, violent. And I say that not to deny there was violence on January 6th. All right. I'm not here to say there was not. But <laughs> but when I say, quote unquote, I mean that that the violence that there was was exaggerated to make it some sort of apocalyptic terrorist event. Yeah. And, which it was not. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's where that stands. Uh, the, as I mentioned, this is probably the last gasp of this committee. And uh, we'll see. Maybe How maybe long they'll, have they been working. It's been the better part of a year now, hasn't it? Uh, it's been a long time time and financial commitment. Yeah. Uh, and we'll see if they can somehow shoehorn this into the ongoing Mar-a-Lago document litigation and wrap it all up into some nice little bow to, uh, to get that, uh, to get Trump once and for all, as we move on beyond the, the midterms and into the, uh, presidential election of 2024 in short order. Well, I was worried that we weren't going to have enough time, but we in fact do. <laughs> which is great. Uh, oh, the only other thing that uh, I um, wanted to leave time for, I don't have the articles up, but we do have a little bit of time. Did you want to talk about any of the FBI developments that are tangential to January 6th? I don't know. Do we need to? Well, it's just more. We learned uh, some things like the FBI tried to, to try to pay for evidence uh, for the, for the Christopher Steele dossier. Uh, we've learned of, uh, Democrat donations from the FBI, certain uh, high level. Yeah, but FBI nobody officials cares. Yeah, this is the thing. Like, uh, conservatives are the only people that are going to know about this. Leftists are going to hear about this, and they're going to be like, "Well, this is old news, true, false, whatever." I don't yeah. care. It's old news. That's like, kind of. I sent you that article, and I was like, "No one is like." I think Dan Bongino was the only person talking yeah. about this. I didn't even hear anybody else in the, on the yeah. right talking about it. And when I set up the show today, it's like I had to cut some stuff for time, and, and I was like, ah. Uh, rampant fbi corruption is important however it's like <laughs> that, that is all do, do i want to talk rampant inflation or rampant fbi corruption yeah, i gotta it's yeah. like, i gotta take one of the constants corruption just anyway. characterizes the fbi these days it's so it's so not news yeah so we were like eh, we're not we're not bringing any information to people on the right they already know what's going on here well uh, the yeah so we'll we'll per perhaps we'll return to some of those stories later on uh, I want to talk about this Fetterman interview, of course. Uh, it is one of the most important uh, Senate races coming up in three weeks, if you still believe in that sort of thing. I know not all <laughs> of us do. But, of course, a race that will decide control of the Senate, and that is in Pennsylvania. And remember, this is a this is a seat that Republicans don't need to win. They need to hold. You have uh, a retiring senator in Pennsylvania, uh, in Toomey, and then you have the thrilling matchup uh, between Dr. Oz, a TV personality who previously did a show on transitioning children, but you're supposed to believe has become, uh, I don't know, has, has realized conservative values since, which my my values, I suppose my philosophy has changed in the same in X amount of years recently. So I'm not saying you can't change your mind. It's just there are questions about Dr. Oz's authenticity, you might say. Yeah, he's inauthentic. Yeah, I think I that's hate this Trump Dr. Oz alliance. What are you doing? Shut up. Well, the alternative is, uh, of course, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, a man who looks like a retired uh, movie villain. And no, just he's a trust fund guy is. Uh, well, I, I he must be. I guess he he was a mayor he lived of a, with his parents until he was 50. He was mayor of a, a town of like 2000 people and brags how he stopped crime there because I'm sure it was out of control. Yeah, really? He stopped all the murders in the town of 2000 people. But of course, he had a stroke six months ago that all but incapacitated him. Or so he insists otherwise. This week, John Fetterman gave his first in-person interview since that stroke in May to demonstrate just how capable he is. But the entire interview had to be conducted uh, with Fetterman reading the reporter's questions through transcription on a computer screen. So the reporter speaks, the computer transcribes it. John Fetterman reads 
the transcription, and then he can respond. And this is because Fetterman's stroke caused auditory processing problems. In other words, he has difficulty hearing speech and converting that to thought and speaking a response. But that's it. It's only that Fetterman and his campaign insist he only has problems hearing things and nothing else about his actual cognition. Um, That is what this interview was supposed to demonstrate. So here is Fetterman showing us, showing us all how capable he is. And then I, I included one additional piece at the end Uh, where he talks about how he'll be an independent voice against his party in the Senate, except for on the core values. And just take note of what the first core value is. Is there some frustration in having to face this, you know, every day? It's not frustration. It's it's just a a challenge, actually. Uh, And I always thought I was pretty empathetic, uh, uh, emphatic. Uh, I think I was very, excuse me, empathetic. Uh, you know, that's an example of the stroke, empathetic. Yeah. I, I always thought I was very empathetic uh, before having a stroke. But now after having that stroke, I really understand, you know, much more kind of the challenges that Americans have day in and day out. Well, if you were the 51st vote, are there issues where you would break with your party? When it comes to core values like abortion or, or minimum wage, or that it's it's the union way of life for that. I would never, I would be that 51st vote. Okay. So, I mean, all things considered, six months post-stroke, he's doing relatively well, although uh, I did not watch the interview in its entirety. It was like 40 minutes long. Yeah, and I'm sure they already had edited it uh, to be uh, a little bit more positive on on him well the allegation from the Fetterman people and from the left in general is that this this interview was unfair but to your point you don't they didn't include the time of him reading questions you don't get a real-time understanding of what this is like you get the reporter asking questions and him responding without the reading in between because that's edited out yeah okay so this guy's a piece of shit of of course but you know, I'm not happy he had a stroke. No, yeah. Or, or, you know, uh, but um, it's clearly going to affect his ability to be in any kind of governing position. Obviously. And I, I and I want to uh, discuss that. The one thing I wanted to say before I forget, um, he said in in that interview at the end, abortion is the core value. Like, is his core value? Did he actually say that? He said, "I will not." On core values, I will not deviate from my party. Examples of core values include abortion. Abortion. And again, it's not right. it's not the freedom to choose, quote unquote. He value abortion is the actual ab- value. Abortion yeah. is the value. That's just yeah. an astounding statement that that kind of went unscrutinized in this interview. And this is perfect for the left, though, because what they want is somebody that's somewhat malleable. And has like a slight vulnerability yeah. that they can manipulate, which is what they thought they were getting with Biden, but his dementia just got too bad. Yeah. And and I <laughs> think that if the reaction to this interview, I think the reaction to this interview is telling to that effect. Mm. Um, you're, you're right. I don't I don't bring this up to point and laugh at a health condition. Uh, and I hope he does recover. But to believe that he has the full mental capacity to serve in the U.S. Senate, well, you have to ignore your eyes and ears when you watch and listen to this interview. And the reporter, Dasha Burns, uh, she also noted that her attempts uh, at small talk with Fetterman before the interview were, were difficult. He didn't appear to understand or be capable of conversation, she said. Other reporters called her out, saying that she's had uh, that they've had totally normal conversations with Fetterman. But as Burns notes, nobody else has actually sat in the room with him. We did find that in small talk before the interview, without captioning, it seemed it was difficult for Fetterman to understand our conversation. Other journalists who've also dealt with Fetterman came forward and said they had a different experience. It's important to note that according to the campaign itself, our team was the first to be in the room with Fetterman for an interview rather than via remote video conference. And and that's what everybody's really pissed off about. I can't believe she divulged that he was incapable of small talk before the interview. What a breach of journalistic ethics. Why? Why? The, the, the question is, can he do the job? It doesn't really matter <laughs> yeah. why he can't do the job. It's like, yeah. you know, Nancy Kerrigan got her knee smashed in. It doesn't really matter why it happened. She still can't <laughs> skate. You're not going to bet on her or whatever. It's like, it can't be, you, you just can't do it. I'm like, I'm sorry you had a stroke. That sucks. But you clearly are not well equipped for this job. Wow. A Kerrigan reference. 
we uh, we've never talked I about whether she recently watched that um that Margot Robbie movie Tanya. Oh, I forgot um, they did. I forgot there was a whole uh, movie yeah. about that. Yeah, it's great. I always hated Nancy Kerrigan, so I thought that was funny. But she had Tanya it coming. Was a, also a mouthy bitch, yeah. Nancy Kerrigan. Yeah, they, they were both just terrible. I just I remember just being glued to that story. Well, it was not a great example, but you would never bet on somebody that was injured in a sports event. Here's another thing your uh, analogy there doesn't consider, though. Maybe this conversation wasn't impossible or weird because it was the Bond villain's fault. It might be (laughs) because it was this reporter's fault. Maybe she's just weird. Maybe she's bad at conversation. This is the theory of Sonny Hostin and Whoopi Goldberg on The View. I actually thought it was inappropriate that she said during small talk uh, before our yeah, interview. Maybe she's bad at small talk. Maybe yeah, it was maybe, her. Maybe it's her. <laughs> I don't know about everybody else, but I love closed caption. I watch all of my series closed caption because yeah. I can't sometimes understand the accents of, that people are using and I don't understand things. And it's very helpful in terms of processing. Okay, okay I, I'm with her. I do that too. But it's not because a piece of my brain died. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that so, is a voluntary choice, not a necessity. Hmm. Uh, and, I like and it, the spin from them though that was pretty good good attempt well and for all of those who are saying this is ableist including Fetterman's wife we'll get to in a minute yes uh, sorry insert the <laughs> yes Chad meme got yes yeah I'm so sorry what? we should want our senators to have exceptional ability it's not able I'm not saying John Fetterman doesn't have the same rights as everybody else but when it comes to choosing who is going to represent us in government I do want people of exceptional ability not impaired ability yeah. It's not to say the disabled don't have rights. It's not to say they don't deserve respect. But I would prefer people in the Senate who are more talented than me, who are smarter yes. than me, who are brighter of than me. Of course. Of I, course. I would like my representation to be exceptional. I, I would, on the theory or the basis that the, this is a job for the elite few, that's the point of the job. It's not, it's not for anybody. We're supposed to be selective. And that's why it's fine to ask questions. But um, but Fetterman says that if you have a problem with that interview, it's because you're you're bizarre. It's because you're strange. It's not that he's strange. No, you No you is what John Fetterman said. You're weird. Not me. You're weird. And I guess I guess weird is probably an unfair accusation. So maybe he was weird before. All right. I don't know. Pre stroke John Fetterman. But what's what's happening now is not just that he's weird. It's that there are concerns about his ability to perform a task based on a medical episode that he had. He said uh, in a reaction interview with Rolling Stone, that interview, I mean, if you're offended or you would not want to consider voting for me because I'm having our interview over closed captioning, that's kind of surreal to me. Why anybody would want to make that an issue. Uh, It's just kind of strange. I don't understand that. It's just bizarre. Evaluating whether you can do the job is strange and bizarre. A surreal experience from the voter. Hey, are you capable of the task? What a surreal experience. Well, he um, doesn't understand. Maybe he doesn't understand because uh, he stroked out. And maybe he has major, major brain trauma. Well, and who the hell's offended? Like, like everybody's watching this interview. Oh, pearl clutching. My sensibilities are offended. Right. No, it's like, OK, that's a guy who seems like he has some limitations. Not sure he's the best candidate for the job on account of the limitations. That is a rational argument that is not based on some emotional uh, offendedness. Fetterman's yeah, wife. But they're, they're using everything they can. They're probably so jazzed about the stroke. I, I guess if you if you need to create if you need to create victimhood in a in a white male, you just you give him a stroke. That's really the only way to do it. Did he even have a stroke? And then, well, now we're on to something. Hmm. Hoax stroke of the week, John Fetterman. His doctors won't talk. Why not? You're onto it. Uh, Fetterman's wife, Giselle, says she felt Ugh. rage when she uh, saw the the reporter Burns had said that her husband was unable to hold a conversation, she called it appalling ableism. She said, uh, speaking with reporters, there are consequences for folks in these positions who are any of these isms. Uh, I mean, she was ableist. That's what she was in her interview. It was appalling to the entire disability community and I think to journalism. So she needs professional consequences. She needs punishment at work and or oh, to man. be fired, I suppose. Um, 
it would be better for them if he was an amputee or something that wouldn't affect his cognitive processing ah. but still would make him sympathetic. They should have cut off his leg, not induced a stroke. They should have made him limpy, not strokey. They, yeah, they went, they exactly. took the wrong approach they, here. They took the wrong approach. Yeah. But again, so the press and the people have no right to ask about the capabilities of the candidates for political office. Here's another theory. It's like uh, maybe they, as you were saying, the powers that be want essentially dead bodies in political office such that they, they can really puppeteer yeah. them. And if they're going to, as long as they're going to have dead people voting for their candidates, they might as well have dead candidates too. Would I, if I ask if John Fetterman is alive, if I ask to see the pulse, is that aliveism? Is that lifeism? <laughs> yes. Uh, what are we talking about here? <laughs> don't be a, don't be a lifeist. Um, <laughs> being alive is not a necessary qualification for office. We have learned that. Do we have Weekend at Bernie coming up? Yeah, appropriately so. Oh, That'll be yeah. next week's movie. And in place of the uh, much desired Brokeback Mountain. Well, <sighs> if you're the sort you're of person. You're not reason with these people, man. It's not going to happen. If you're the sort you're of person like, who. Why? Uh, why? Let me phrase it in a blonde way. If you're the sort of cuck who still gives a rat's ass about voting or polling. Uh, Dr. Oz has closed some of the gap with Fetterman in recent weeks, but Fetterman maintains a three point edge over Oz, according to the real clear politics polling average. As I mentioned early in the show, I think Fetterman is a guarantee to win because the clown show commands it. It, it, it is has far to go too, on. But Dr. Oz is a disaster, too. I know. And that's the thing is like if Dr. Oz, now that I've said it, I'm guaranteed to be wrong. So this is the other side of that prediction. I said <laughs> yeah. a definitive statement in prediction one way, which means it's 100% going to go the other way. If Dr. Oz gets in, like, okay, gun to the head, would I prefer Dr. Oz to Fetterman? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. I don't know, but you don't know what Dr. Oz believes. All right, I'm going to make a Fetterman argument. <laughs> okay, go for it. At least he's out there saying, like, listen, this is my plan. Is he out there saying... <laughs> <laughs> is he yeah, out there saying barely anything? saying yeah. using closed captions to yeah. say, but we know what his platform is going to be. I think that Dr. Oz is full of shit about what he really believes. Well, I if nothing else, even if Dr. Oz maintains what might be considered sensible values on issues like um, uh, transgender policy or abortion or things yeah. like that, I guarantee you he's the exact sort of guy who's going to vote to spend every dollar we don't have in Ukraine and all the other things that are that are. <sighs> from a federal spending perspective that are causing the issues that are most pressing in all of our lives. I have yeah, no faith in, yeah. in Dr. Oz to, yeah, yeah. to bring down, even though he does those, those commercials where are those uh, videos where he identifies with the people by buying vegetables at the grocery store and pretending to be shocked. Look at the price of this broccoli as though I've yeah, ever really. purchased broccoli. And by, I mean him <laughs> as though he's ever, you know, gone to the store to purchase broccoli on his own behalf in that way, at least anytime <laughs> recently. Lord. All right. Uh, anything else before hoax hate? Uh, no, let's do it. All right. And now the nobody saw it happen, but it's totally a product of Trump's America hoax hate crime of the week. Ah, shit, it's backwards. You think they'll notice? In Opelika, Alabama, apology for any mispronunciation there, 18-year-old Pharrell Smith has been arrested and faces charges for allegedly threatening to shoot black fairgoers attending the Lee County Fair. And as you may be able to discern from this somewhat unclear photo, Smith is himself black. On September 19th, the Opelika Police Department was made aware of a racially inflammatory Facebook post by an individual threatening to shoot attendees of a certain oh demographic <laughs> at the upcoming fair. Investigators were able to trace the social media account to a residence in nearby Lafayette, Alabama. The residence was connected to Pharrell Smith, who was arrested by the Lafayette Police Department on October 6th, according to this story, on unrelated charges. So he apparently had some extra criminal activity that got him caught. Uh, mm -hmm. But as far as the specific content of the post, I have not seen a screenshot or an image, but local reporting in Alabama uh, says that this post uh, or the poster. So this is Pharrell Smith posing as, I guess, a white supremacist. He said he and his friends were coming to the Opelika, Alabama fair to kill every 
Does Susan allow the word? If my mid leg joint were to expand, my knee would grow. That's that's you the say Negro. And that's he's going to the fair to kill all of the growing knees. Gotcha. And uh, all of those that he lays eye contact on. So be prepared. White power in all caps. <laughs> Uh, the profile that Smith created included a Confederate battle flag. Regrettably, I couldn't find the images, but uh, that is what happened in that particular case. That's a short one. Anything else uh, that you'd like to say on that one? Nope. It's the same every week. Always the same. I, come on with this hoax hate. Like, I, I, I need something that surprises me. We need better than Facebook posts. I know. I need more. All right. I need somebody to really plan something out. You know, isn't that the beauty of like a really good prank is is it being elaborate yeah we uh the de- the details have been lacking i'll give you that but they never quit Amazing. and i appreciate the the tenacity the persistence the perseverance oh yeah uh, it, but it's a marketplace like any other right so as demand for hoax hate goes up then the quality of the supply can be reduced mm. it's commensurate at this point, we're getting like the cheap Chinese imports of hoax. Hate. That's exactly what we're, we're getting, getting. The Walmart uh, discount bin of hoax. You remember hate. those old hoax? Hate? Mm, great. <laughs> We've had some classics. That yeah. Jewish professor that wrote dirty heave all over her, uh, <laughs> all over her office at Columbia well, University. Like more of that. And That's and the classic, uh, you know, painting your car and leaving the red spray paint in the background and making GoFundMe. Oh, so and, good. We you, gonna be rich. Jesse Smollett. You know, Jesse Smollett was Jesse a high Smollett level. Jesse Smollett was great, yeah. Uh, but he, that was peak hoax hate. But the effort, nobody really has out Jesse Jesse in terms of the multi year commitment to the bit through the uh, prosecution. So um, to that wow, to that he point, a hero? well, uh, I, I have to uh, give him the respect he deserves for sure. Mm. I am not suicidal. Anything else before the movie review? Nope. All I right. think in an attempt to keep the show short. Well, we wait, the intro's the already show. started. Too much. Ah, oh, damn, sorry. Give it some respect. Of movie references flying so over his head, one man will, will finally watch them. This is the Matt and Blonde Show movie review. This week's movie is the 1998 psychological sci fi comedy drama, basically all of the genres. The Truman Show in which unbeknownst to him, a man's entire life is a made-for-TV work of fiction until he notices too much, starts asking questions, and confronts his fear to break the illusion from movie picker Sergey, the only Jim Carrey movie that doesn't suck. A man breaks free from manufactured reality by conquering his deepest fear and overcoming quite a few obstacles from the powers of the world. As always, (laughs) your review and your rating, as well as what I may have just interrupted you on. Oh, no, that doesn't matter. Um, I just realized we're going to have a short show. I think that we accidentally cut too many topics out. Maybe. Although it was was an accident. I try not to push it too close to three hours. So let's talk about um, the Truman Show for 40 minutes then. Okay, I probably could. I probably (laughs) please don't. Please don't. Um, I love Peter Weir, the director. Um, He made Picnic at Hanging Rock, a bunch of other movies that like I just I just loved Master and Commander. I think that was Peter Hmm. Weir. Let me know if I'm wrong in the live chat. Um. So it was so easy to like this movie. I've seen it before, but it's been 15 years probably. Um, And it's a really, it's an interesting concept. Like what is reality? Uh, If it's real to you, is it real? And I think the obvious answer is, is no, you can't create your own reality. What is real is the experience that all of us share. Um, And that's the whole point of the movie, right? Uh, you you can't live in a reality that's that's just made for you, whether it's by your own creation or by the creation of somebody else. Like the whole human experience is about us experiencing pain together, happiness together, and that's just um, that's the reality of of all of our lives. And so by bypassing that, no matter what he was experiencing, it was a it was an inauthentic experience. Um, so some criticism, some typical overacting by Jim Carrey, but I think that in this role. It, it kind of worked. Um, I also, I hate Laura Linney and her cabbage patch face. Every time I see it, I don't know why. She's not a wife? bad actress. Yeah. Okay. She's not a bad actress, but every time I, I see her face in a role, I just want to just press her face against a stove. And I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. 
It's just, but but for this role, her so punchable did, uh, face was So did perfect. Truman when they had the fight there. He wanted to press her face against the stove too. I know. It's Almost. just her like. So close. Dee dee, you yeah. know? Bing. Yeah. Uh, I just, I just hate it. But for this, it was really good. Um, all in all, I really liked it. No, no major criticisms. Four out of five. All right. Well, I bet you loved this movie. I bet you loved it. You I bet correct. you gave it a five out of five. Uh, let me withhold my rating, but you are correct that I did love this. And uh, I know I saw this sometime close to when it came out. I was only 10 or 11 when it came yeah, out. So I yeah. think this was in my teen years, maybe a few years after. I remember thinking that it sucked, but I also think that I was a teenager who wanted to see Jim Carrey comedy and ended up with yeah. this and didn't get it. Yeah, yeah. So now I'm watching it and I'm thinking like, this is them telling us how they did it before they did it. And it's like, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's just like today where they've hired an army of people to tell us all yeah. that we're crazy for observing what's, what's right in front of our face. And so that's, of course, the broad theme of why I loved this movie. Just the themes of what it would take to perpetuate a so-called conspiracy theory. It, it confronts that, that major criticism that you always hear in response to any so-called conspiracy theory. Well, how many people would have to be in on it? Would they all keep the secret? Yeah. And, and what I think we've learned over the last couple of years is n- not everybody really has to be in on it in the way that they're intentionally deceiving other people. If you just make people's, if, if you get a few power centers to exert some social pressure through perceived authority, you can get people to engage in all sorts of irrational self-defeating behavior because their job depends on it. Because exactly. their house payment depends on it, because their family relationship depends on it. Uh, what other, whatever other crucial resource. And I'm not saying that the people who went along to get along were irrational for that. But let's say that you went against your own personal judgment and you wore the mask and you got the vaccine and you did X, Y, and Z, even though you didn't want to, because you just wanted to preserve what you had. Are you in on it at that point? Or are you a person who made some sacrifices in pursuit of preserving what you think is important to preserve? Th- that those are interesting things to think about. Of course, in the Truman show, everybody actually is in on it to the extent they're compensated to be in on it. They created an entire um, fake world. So that's not a perfect comparison, but during the, the TV interview, one of my favorite scenes in the movie is the TV interview with the director, Christoph and Christoph yeah. says, well, we accept the reality of the world with which we are presented. And that's that's the fundamental lesson of this movie. And I think the last couple of years that we've had, as long as you willingly submit to let other other people define the world for you, you can be taken in all sorts of nonsensical mm-hmm. directions. It can't I'm not saying you can't take wisdom and advice from other people. But if there's nothing higher than human power centers to define the world for you, if there's nothing to define the world beyond that you'll get all kinds of nonsensical definitions that you must obey. And if you totally, willingly submit totally. yourself to that, yeah. you'll, you can end up in a complete fiction world in the way that he was. Um, mm-hmm. I loved, I don't know that they meant to, to make a nod to some deeper conspiracy theories, but the fact that the weather itself was controlled, yeah. cue the sun, get the I know, sun. I, I loved that. Yeah. And the fact that the moon was literally fake, <laughs> You know, that's like I, I joked in the review, like, forget the, the moon landing is fake. That That's normie nonsense. The, the, the real wisdom, the 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 true big brains know that the moon <laughs> itself is fake. So I love that in this movie. The themes of confronting your fear to break the illusion mm-hmm. that you, that 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 a scared person is a controllable person. Again, we've learned that lesson the hard way. Um, you can you can shackle a man with his own fear, I think, more harshly than you can sometimes with a physical cage if there's a will to break out of the physical cage there's often a way you cripple the will and you eliminate the way yeah uh loved the way that the elite were portrayed uh in this movie and by the elite in this movie i mean like the production crew and the director of the show but just again the parallels to what we've dealt with uh don't go truman there's no more truth out there than there is in my world yeah but the difference is out there it, it is a it is a creation of the natural order or God himself. The yeah. the fake world is a creation of hum, of of humankind, which carries all sorts of imperfections. And that's exactly. not to say the natural world is is uh, perfect or that it doesn't have its flaws. But but we have to live with respect for the natural world and we can prosper in it through that. We don't you try to perfect or control or imitate the natural the natural world. We get in trouble. We suffer. 
And um, he knew that he was never going to be able to go back once he had seen the truth, too. Yeah, that was a great theme, too. It's like, how could you go back? Yeah. In the same way of trying to put myself in the mindset of like a person who formerly voted Democrat or something yeah, like that. Like, exactly. How, how could I go back after having my eyes opened? Uh, the theme that the director knows you better than you know you just again, these people like assume this moral authority. Uh, I can make I'm better than you. I'm wiser than you. I'm smarter than you. And therefore, I should have total control over your entire life. Christoph and Dr. Fauci are all but interchangeable. Oh, yeah. They even looked a little alike. Uh, and then the, the on a really underrated piece, my wife picked up on this and I'm glad she did. Um, when he has that TV interview, the the reporter, the interviewer says, well, hey, thanks for your time, Christoph. I know how jealously you guard your privacy. But he delivers that line deadpan, like sincerely. And Christoph acknowledges it sincerely. And it's the engagement. Of course, he's built he's built his entire life and career on the violation of another man's privacy. But they both yeah. accept that premise as though it's not a joke. Like it's it's a joke line, but they are totally serious about it. Yeah, Again, these yeah. people engaging in the double standards and the hypocrisies with a straight face because the only way that makes sense is if you live in the world where there are two classes of people, people who have rights and people who don't. Yeah. And they live in that world sincerely. Yeah. So those are all the things I loved um, that my criticisms are just uh, like ticky tack things that I put in here mostly to to fill the the format. And I don't mean to <laughs> I know I know that I, I tend to think about things too critically sometimes you have to suspend a little bit of disbelief and of course to accept this world you you that's what you have to do but just a few points of silliness i think to consider uh, number one it, it is legally nonsensical the idea that i could envision a world in which a corporation adopts a child i i, I don't think we're that far off from such a concept to be honest yeah but even when you adopt, like if, if you adopt a child, that doesn't entitle you to control of the child in adulthood. That's still kidnapping. And they don't or, lose their basic human rights. Yeah. yeah, false imprisonment. And it's not, again, this whole movie, I get it. It's a, it's, a, it's a whole conspiracy operation. But everybody in the world is watching it. And the idea that no law enforcement would ever intervene with what is plainly false imprisonment on display every single day, that seems a, a little silly. But maybe the, maybe the world operates in some sort of legal exception that... You know, I, I don't understand. That's fine. Um, what Truman notices as weird and why I have a hard time understanding, because if you're raised in this world where your sense of what is weird and what isn't is totally warped, how do you have a how basis for know? comparison? So when he says, hey, yeah. look, the, the, the pedestrians and the cars are on a loop. It's like, yeah, dude, you've been living in this world for 30 years, though. And so it's totally normal for you to see a loop of these people. But maybe what, he, would just, he just wouldn't observe it. Maybe. Uh, hasn't been paying attention. And then he's he's got like a camera in his actual wedding band. Like you notice all these subtle things, but you don't notice the cameras everywhere and think that that's weird, including the camera that's in your ring. Um, it, it just doesn't make sense fully to me that he comes to these outside world realizations when the world of the island is all that he knows. And to that point, if you're if you're raising him to exist within this island, why did they raise him to be aware of the outside world at all? Why wouldn't you raise him to believe the yeah. island is all there is and all there all ever there will is. be? He'll have no desire ever to leave. Fear is a hell of a motivator. I get, I like that theme of the movie, but obliviousness or ignorance, if he has no concept that there's another place to go, I, I would bet on him never even imagining that such a thing is possible. Why wouldn't you That's go with true. that? Why would you raise him to know about, they had that whole bit and it was funny. Like I want to be an explorer when I grow up and the teacher says, Oh, you're too late. All the areas have been explored, <laughs> but that still grants the premise that there are other places to go besides this Island. Why wouldn't you just say yeah, they didn't need to tell him any of that. Yeah. It doesn't make like, well, why would you that's self-defeating to the scheme, but, but you're right. Uh, all in all, uh, I did give it a five wiki perfection <laughs> rating. Wiki, wiki, wiki. Wiki, 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 wiki. Wiki, wiki. We love you. You're very special. And that is uh, because I thoroughly enjoyed the themes, the writing, the performances all combined to make a great reminder to challenge everything about the world around you to discover what is really true. Uh, no matter how many times they call you crazy while you do it. I knew it. You, you know me well. You uh, yep. you called it. I I suspected you would like it, but I, I there was a small part of me that thought maybe she's going to completely shit on this movie. 
I could I see know, it happen. I told you. I told you today. I like I like for you to think that I'm 20% insane and unpredictable. It's good for the show. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. Uh, early vote, <gasps> um, solid 65%. Two-thirds of the early movie raters are giving it four or five. So really? a lot of love for this movie, um, which uh, I'm kind of surprised by. The other thing I didn't mention, it, it has, really has nothing to... I'll separate the art and the artist, but... Like Jim Carrey, the guy just irritates the hell out of me. Like Jim Carrey, the Twitter you. account can't yeah. stand Jim Carrey's performance. in this was fine. I think the, the writing and the concepts were better to me than Jim Carrey himself. But I figured this movie might get some hate just on the basis of Jim Carrey alone. Anyway, as I mentioned, uh, I'm sorry to everyone who voted Brokeback Mountain. It was a high turnout yes. uh, event. The final showdown between what ended up being Weekend and Bur- Weekend at Bernie's and Brokeback Mountain. Weekend at Bernie's does win thanks to yet another narrow vote. Brokeback was edged three weeks in a row, I think. And it will now be retired until maybe its nomination will return again one day. But it will be Weekend at Bernie's next week. And after that, I mentioned we'll have something special for the fifth and final Sunday in October. Well... We are giving the nominations to our trusty production assistant and call-in show screener, Dangerous Spaces. So these movies nominated by uh, Dangerous Spaces, they are up for a vote this week and this week only. So do choose wisely. The options are the usual suspects, Pirates of the Caribbean, the the Curse of the Black uh, Pearl, Paddington, Dodgeball, A True Underdog Story, One Hour Photo, Tropic Thunder, crocodile dundee of course <laughs> dangerous spaces is uh an aussie man himself uh, or minority okay. report or of course you can uh reject the list and select a randomly chosen top rated movie instead uh as a reminder if you would like to read my weekly movie reviews comment how wrong i am uh, submit your own rating for the movie and sign up for the chance to be the movie nominator for the month. The one and only place to do that is in my weekly movie review linked in the description. And of course, over through the homepage of the website that is Matt Christensen media dot com. All right. That's a show. That is a show. Let's catch up with the chat. Sure. All right. I got one more over on, uh, uh d live john comes back and he says uh gates is pronounced like gates that's you're right i have seen that i don't know why that doesn't stick in my mind because i've heard too many people pronounce it gets and it just kind of looks like gets to me but you're right i have heard him say that it's gates even though it's spelled all weird who's next boogeyman yeah i believe so i don't remember where we left off happy birthday matt cheers well thank you i appreciate it um brom 39 does body count actually matter i see plenty of videos of people that are arguing about it okay so there's a the study that everybody refers to um about female sexual partners and uh, marital satisfaction uh it is it's not a great study so marital satisfaction is defined by still being married at five years i feel like Mm. almost everybody can make it to five years. Come on. That's not, you could also be unsatisfied and still married and still married. Right. That's a Um, proxy. I guess. So that's a problem. I mean, I don't know how else they're going to define it. A 20 year study would be a lot better, but what they found was women with one sexual partner and over nine had lower divorce rates. I mean, okay. So the highest divorce rates were people that had two sexual partners and women that had had over 10 sexual partners. So they had the the highest divorce rates. So I do not know why that is, but that is the phenomenon that that, that they discovered in the study. Why would mm. that be? Do you think? I understand yeah, the I high body count. Some but why two, specifically two sexual partners uh, is causative, problem, presumably, if if you can establish causation from this, which you really can't. Maybe there's um, something to the compare and contrast. Maybe there's something to lower self value or self esteem associated with higher counts. Then why of- were the divorce rates for women that had had three to 10 sexual partners as almost as oh, it was low. only two. It was only two. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know that I have a great theory for why that would be, but I assume the people who study it would have some explanation. Yeah. But it, it's also, it's possible that it could be arbitrary. And that the study could mean nothing because uh, five years still married is not a good proxy for whether or not you're in a good marriage. 
Uh, and uh, the other factor here, body count, I mean, body count matters from a health perspective, too. That yeah. that also has to be stated, though. Consult your uh, health class teacher for that rather than me. That's true. Um, <laughs> Phil, yeah. if the parent's response to their son being gunned down by outdated farm equipment. Who is he talking about? Uh, I don't know. This. Uh, what did we talk about? It's about race relations. Um, I don't know. Phil, uh, I might have lost the reference on this one. It's to go full Mr. Tibbetts. <laughs> not Molly's dad. <laughs> yeah, Molly's dad. I don't know who you're talking about. He's not talking about Ian and Ryan Petty. He said their son. So, But I don't remember what story he, you could be referring to that we discussed today. Let me look back at the notes because I apparently um, have forgotten. Uh, Ooga Boogaloo. If she's 12 and he's 30, that means he's exactly 2.5 times her age. If this college girl waits until she's in her 30s, that means he could be as old as 75. That was 100% a proposition. He's cracked um, the code. That Falling. was four days ago, five days ago. And we did talk about Sandy Hook, of course, too, but I don't know that Phil's referring to Sandy Hook. What am Is I missing? slave thing? I don't get it, you guys. I'm sorry, Phil. Phil, I don't get it. I don't get it. We have failed you. But of course, uh, thank you for your support for the show. The live chat is saying that um, we're dumb and it's about slavery. Oh, because outdated farm equipment <laughs> equals slaves. Ah. The, you got, there you got. It is. Okay. You got one. <laughs> outdated farm equipment. God, dude. I, sometimes, you people. Jeez. <laughs> uh. I still don't know what story you're talking about. Uh, deserve the ridicule of the world the last couple of years. Whose kid got killed by a black dude? Uh, I don't know. What? what uh, <laughs> maybe it's a story we didn't cover. I'm, I guess I'm just missing it. My Anna apologies, Hitch. Phil. I, I've completely butchered it. Hi, Blonde. I emailed you last week. Please get back to me when you can with a yay or nay. Oh, I'm sorry, Anna. I'm, I'm so shite at responding to people's emails. Thank you, Anna. Okay, Phil. Why conservatives keep hiding behind out groups to own the libs? This Dearborn situation as the re the most recent example. Um, in my opinion, it's going to turn out the same way. The Welsh inviting Angles and uh, Saxons to help fight domestic enemies. Okay, so th my thing about Muslims is and being strange bedfell bedfellows with Muslims is that they're already here. I'm not talking about bringing in new Muslims, but like I got to deal with all of the like all of these people in Minnesota and all this shit. Like, come on, can't I, can I use a Somali to like take down a, a tranny loving leftist? Like just swing a Somali to take down a left. Come on. <laughs> I've seen Captain Phillips. They're very good with boats and AKs. That's true. Uh, which, if we uh, already have to deal with these people, we might as well seize the day. I eh? disavow, by the way, Susan. That's the Somali standard, not my standard. I prefer mm. justice achieved through a process, not boats and AKs. But I have seen... <laughs> Justice pursued through boats and AKs in certain historical settings. And they're so tall and thin. Do you think that if they all like cross their arms like a like a braid that you could just like take a bunch of them and just like wipe people out? Just <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to carry on. Carry on. Why don't you read a few of these? The next one uh, is Esoteric Unbound. Yeah. Well, in mine, it's Robin. So I'll go with Robin. I know our list gets What is going on with our system? I, I think it's just the way I have it displayed. There's nothing wrong with the system. It's just I have a single stack oh, okay. and you might have a double stack. Okay. Okay. Robin says, uh, Matt and I once made love at the speed of science. What does that even mean? I don't know. And neither do you. My speed of science is as much yeah. of a farce as the idea of Matt and I actually doing it. Well, <laughs> thank you. What Robin. a weird phrase. The speed of science. Yeah. Science is famously slow moving. So I don't. Yeah. It, it, I don't know and it really should be. It should then. be heavily scrutinized in a, in much the same way that our political system is supposed to operate with a whole bunch of checks a whole bunch of scrutiny along the way so is science you're supposed to check your work at every step to make yeah, sure it's in fact yeah. correct you're exactly. right that's that's a, a slow it's speed. exhaustive yeah. yeah esoteric unbound says blonde prefers an alliance between muslims and the right as long as it's an alliance along the lines of the molotov ribbentrop pact i'm i have to plead historical ignorance on that what is that Mm. Uh, that is a here it's a non-aggression pact between nazi germany and the soviet union that enabled those powers to partition poland oh between them so it's allying with the uh, commies and then having that come back to bite you are muslims really communists though 
Uh, I don't know if communist would be the appropriate term, but certainly authoritarian. Uh, that would be a, an appropriate term, in, generally speaking. Yeah. Not always, but generally speaking. It's it's a flaw in my female thinking, though. Like I, um, I'm attracted to uh, collectivist authoritarianism. It's why I'm like really into the Chinese lately. But they're greatly flawed. I mean, I, I shouldn't I shouldn't look at cultures like this and be like they're on to something. <laughs> Well, I, I suppose it's commentary on how far we have fallen or are falling where uh, you 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 look at it. It's like it's like looking at, at Oz and thinking at least he's not Fetterman. That's yeah. that's the trap. Um, OK. Rom 39. I really don't have very much pity for Alex Jones on this. I wonder how much call Rittenhouse can get from the media for what they did. Well, we're going to find to out. I know that loads of money, I guess. I know they're pursuing. um defamation cases we'll see where they go if they go but i think it's totally different like okay what alex jones did was it unethical yeah probably but did he actually affect the reputation or earning potential of the sandy hook families in a meaningful way no i think most people looked at alex jones and they were like that guy is off of his rocker right well, their claim, I mean, their claim is that the, it caused people to go to the actual homes of these families and 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 uh, cause all sorts of other problems, which these all sound like minor inconveniences, uh, probably a little traumatic for them. But what happened to Kyle? Kyle Rittenhouse was like persona non grata, like like no job, couldn't live a normal life, was never going to have a family. What they did to him, I mean, it was true, truly defamatory. Well, the difference for me, and again, I people who follow the trial close uh, more closely, I invite you to to send me um, your thoughts otherwise, because I, I don't claim to have expertise on all the specific facts of this. But what I have seen from afar or have not seen is claims that were on the same level of specificity. So with with Alex Jones, he talks about the, the Sandy Hook parents as a class. And I'm not saying that people can't be identified within that class, but I don't see a lot of statements about this specific parent is a crisis actor. This specific yes, parent true. is yeah. a faker. That's true, too. And and you, with defamation and, and groups, there's got to be some sort of identifiability or, or specificity in that accusation. And, I, you know, this is not to say that that that. Uh, Again, that I've seen every piece of information and Alex Jones did not say specific quotes. It's just what I have seen so far that that specificity, it's not the same thing as saying Kyle Rittenhouse is a murderer. It, yeah. it lacks the specific person. But the parents are crisis actors is not, at least in my view of defamation, the same thing as Kyle Rittenhouse is a murderer. One is a much more specific statement. I agree. Yeah. Um, Robin D. Banks, Matt and I, or Blonde and I once made hate. I see. I just, I just instinctively said Matt and I. I'm suing Knuckle Hunky Buck six grillion dollars for false statements made last week, and Matt appears. How many times we do it, Robin? I'm sorry, I didn't mean it, Robin. This is, <laughs> yeah. You want to take over? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Phil, Phil, Phil. <laughs> Phil is Funny. curious about the history of Robert Reich, the appropriately named Robert Reich. No, never mind. No, Phil. No, you won't read that. <laughs> he wants to. Cons Phil says he wants to consult Mel Gibson or Kanye. OK, <laughs> come on for Phil. That is like some. I guess that is pretty tame for Phil. Uh, Danny from Montana says uh, he gets you too. be careful. OK, my my SC would have been perfect for last week. What's SC? I don't know. Oh, my super Did chat. Oh, oh my super chat would have been perfect last week in the Dallas, Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas area. Oh, okay. There's a decent population of, of bipties <laughs> that refuse to poo in the loo and literally dump their. OK, what a, what a bright and vibrant culture. Uh, cheers. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Danny. Uh, well, OK. <laughs> now we've learned everything from uh, this no, Indian no, restaurant that, in Virginia. That is racist. I mean, like. As Americans, you have to expect at least 70% of Indian Americans to know how to poop in the toilet. Wow. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Long time John says, uh, oh, wait, Lupus Albus says, if the case is of damages uh, for lies, uh, wait, wait, wait. If the cases of damages for lies is the point, can CNN be taken to task for the loss of jobs for the safe, safe and effective yeah. class action? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I suppose if you want to do this class thing maybe that's the way that we go 
What about all these fucking doctors that told people that hormone treatment was reversible and didn't have any long term effects? Um, and and this gender transition thing, like, hmm. it, are are we really going to are we going to do this? Okay, are we going to start using the legal system to take people down because we can do it a lot better? I bet on the right. Hmm. Well, I guess the defamation wars are coming. Uh, Long Dong John, this is an interesting question. If you two were on the jury, would you have sent Cruz to the chair? Well, this is um, this is a very difficult question because if I were to answer truthfully, if they asked me, do you oppose the death penalty on principle or would you send anyone to death? Uh, in general, on principle, I oppose the death penalty. Not because some yeah. people, not because it's never a just uh, outcome, but because I distrust the state with the application of that punishment. However, could, could I apply Florida law as written in the evidence of this case as presented? I think that I could. And based on my understanding of the case, the aggravating factors being present and proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose I could, but, but if you're asking about purely my politics, I have a lot of hesitation about the death penalty. I, I don't know yeah. that it would be fair to say never. I don't know that I'm that firm in my view, but I do have a lot of hesitation about it as a policy. And I I even have some hesitation. You know, I didn't, I didn't bring uh, Ryan and Ian on to have a debate. Uh, I want to hear what their thoughts are about this. So I'm not trying to, to challenge, uh, to challenge everything from a political perspective that they're saying, but I, I do have some reservations and hesitation about lowering the threshold for the application of the death penalty for the same reason. <clears throat> and I know it, it, I certainly understand from their perspective that it would be frustrating to have what appears to be one juror hold up that process, hold up what you believe yeah. to be justice. There is another side of that though. And and the, the more we lower thresholds for, for the, the penalty of death, the more we increase the prospect for error and the, the state killing someone in error, I think is, something we ought to be very, very careful about that, that, that sort of power. I, uh, I'm skeptical. of. I'm distrustful. Of. I agree. Um, yeah, in theory, I'm against the death penalty, but if it was my daughter, my sister, anybody in my family, any of my friends, I'd be like, let's nuke this motherfucker. <laughs> you know, yeah. I would just, I would just, I want, I'd want revenge. I'd want, you know, it, it, and if, it's not about revenge to the families, I'm sure, but that's what I would want. Well, if it was Cruz, though, let's say that you were on this jury and it was Cruz. Do you do you think that you would be able to serve? What would you have done? I suppose. What do you think? I don't know. I think that some people are uh, truly irredeemably evil. Hmm. I, I that's you, you probably feel this would be one such philosophy. case. Yeah, I I I think I would send him to death. Hmm. I certainly understand the argument. Again, I I. I I'm critical, skeptical, but if you're going to have the death penalty on the books, it's hard for me to imagine a case much more deserving of it than something like yeah. this. Yeah. And I should mention, I don't, I'm not suggesting that I think that, um, Ian and Ryan are taking a, a punitive standpoint or anything no, like that. I, like, I think they're like any yeah. reason you have for wanting the, the murderer of your child to, to, to go to death is valid and legitimate. I'm just talking about like, if this happened to me, I would be filled with an insatiable yeah. rage. One thing that, that only vengeance would um, would be able to satiate. Another thing that we didn't get into, but uh, I, I, you know, watching this this uh, this trial and then the Darrell Brooks uh, Waukesha car attack trial, I was watching some of that live again this week. I watched in that case Darrell Brooks cross examining a witness. The witness, his three year old daughter, was hit by Darrell Brooks. I believe she survived. She was not killed. But you got this guy on the stand being interviewed by the guy who hit his daughter with a car and killed a bunch of people and maimed a bunch of others. And it's one thing to be in the room and have to maintain calm and civility with someone who, who killed your child yeah. in this case to actually be actively questioned by the guy who nearly did it. And then you had Darrell Brooks. <laughs> the exchange was so funny. Darrell Brooks said to this guy, uh, you told investigators that the, that the man who hit your daughter was of dark complexion. Oh, that's uh, yes, right, that's yeah. correct. Uh, and yet you accuse me. You accuse me of uh, of being that man. Uh, yes, that's correct. I do. Uh, I saw you. Uh, wh what do you say? Look, 
are you saying I have dark complexion? And then the guy's thinking like, well, I don't want to be racist, but yeah. How do I get out of He's this? like, well, it depends yeah. on your definition of dark. And then Darrell Brooks said, uh, well, what are you saying that all black people have dark complexion? Uh, yeah, there is variation, but yes, that is uh, the <laughs> defining feature of the term. And I'm just thinking, my God, dude, to, to actually have your child hit by this guy. And then you have I, to deal with this. I yeah. told the story on the call-in show of the woman, and I won't retell the whole story, don't worry. But I had an experience where a crazy lady almost hit a shopping cart with my son in it. I mean, within a few feet, probably two months ago. And I had to, I confronted her, and there was something of a hostile <laughs> confrontation. Because something of it was straight almost, up hostile. She yeah. almost killed my kid and then yeah. told me it was my fault for walking in a grocery store parking lot. So for... To be in a situation where they actually do kill your kid or injure your kid, to be on the stand nationally televised and have to maintain composure, or certainly in the case of, of, of the Petties and all of these families, to be in this courtroom and maintain composure, deal with this entire process for four plus years waiting for justice, yeah. and in their view, have it robbed from you. I think that's perfectly valid. I, I, I can't imagine the emotional experience that that is. That's got to be what so intensely nightmare. frustrating. That would be, um, yeah, I just don't know how people can get over the anger. No. They talked a little bit about that, didn't they? Well, uh, value of family, man. They, uh, mm -hmm. they are a, a great demonstration of that. Semper Ad Meliora says, so can we all sue Fauci for defamation when he said two weeks to flatten the curve? That was a lie, Robert that Reich. That was a lie, yeah. Yeah, I, I, this is the standard we're going with. <laughs> Although... I don't know. If Fauci is the science, if you filed a defamation lawsuit against Fauci, would he just turn into you know, Palpatine from Star Wars? I am the law, too. I am the Senate, whatever. Uh, Semper, uh, oh, that's the one I just read. General Grievance says, Lispy voice, your children are watching <laughs> based rag top. Yes, they are. <laughs> now, get now back of the bus, Gaylord. Okay, jeez. <laughs> It's a lot of hate in that heart, but that is more yeah, or less what we just watched. Can't we band together with Muslims to Rosa Parks, these homosexuals? <laughs> Only that guy, that guy specifically. Based. Uh, okay, who's next? I've lost my spot. Let's see. I just reloaded. G hold on, hold on. Max. Yeah, that's right. I forgot to say the aforementioned book also highlights many of the illnesses our modern society suffers, mass killings included at its core. The problem is our disconnect from everyone and community around us. That is true. Um, I think that most of our societal problems are rooted in uh, an inability to trust our neighbors, which is a community breakdown um, manifestation and uh, the breakdown of the nuclear family. Hmm. Thank you, Max. Uh, Michael, Michael Anderson. Best quick stocking data shows that Gates' parents brought, bought the Truman House, Santa Rosa, Florida, in 1991 when Gates was nine. His bio suggests he was born in California and grew up in Oklahoma. Thank you for oh. doing the preliminary work that I had already forgotten about. Thank you. Michael Anderson. Yes. Michael Mammoth. I met my ex-college girlfriend recently. She has two kids by two men and works a dead-end job. Got to tell her I make 200000 a year. My life is great. <laughs> I love it when the attractiveness curve inverts with time. <laughs> well, oh, good for you. Sincerely, congratulations, yeah. Michael. Um, I hear you. I always wonder what what ex boyfriends think about me if they find my YouTube channel. They'll probably be like, <laughs> "This is a disaster." Like, I'm so I dodged a bullet. This is a this chick is a disaster. They're super chatting on commie channels right now about how they dodged a bullet. Um, probably right. No, uh, that that is great, Michael. I um, I'm I'm glad that you made good choices. It sounds like, and yeah, you know, I try I try not to be I try not to have like a vengeful attitude about things like that. That said, when someone wrongs you, and I don't know if she wronged you, maybe she did, maybe she didn't, but when someone wrongs you, there is a certain satisfaction in having the last laugh. I, I can't deny that. I guess so, but how long to to get over it? Like there were people in my life I thought I was never going to forgive, but I never could carry it longer than like hmm. three years before I was like, oh, I don't give a shit anymore. Hmm. You, you, your, your vengeance flame burns out. That surprises me. I figured you'd carry it forever. Yeah. I just, hmm. it, it, you know, wanting vengeance, it requires a lot of emotional energy Yeah. that I put into hating other people. Ah, well, as long as it's going somewhere. Thank it you, is. Michael. 
Um, Robert Lockhart, blonde as Nancy Pelosi and bullhorns and patriotic face paint would be the best Halloween costume. Ever. Ah, I, like it. I hadn't thought of that. Like we it. could do ma- January 6th mashup Pelosi. Mm. Hmm. Behena fam. The election against Brokeback Mountain was de- definitely fortified. Honestly, it's not terrible. It's a tale of star-crossed lovers unable, unable to be together. Like Romeo and Juliet, but with more anal. <laughs> God. <laughs> Uh, it might have been fortified. I don't know. But uh, uh, there are protections against repeat voting. So I'm confident that it's not fortified in that way. There are protections against VPN usage. I'm confident. In that. It's not impossible, but uh, there are certain safeguards. I also know that when the vote was within two on Wednesday, uh, I mentioned it and said, if you have a passionate opinion on whether we should or should not watch Brokeback Mountain, you got to get in there and vote. So I think that pushed a few more. I voted against it. <laughs> well, I guess you're entitled to that. My wife votes, yeah. so. And because you get one she vote. She voted yes, I know it. Because you get one vote per household. I don't mm-hmm. get to vote. She gets to vote. That's fair. James Rogers. Hey, y'all. It's your favorite dirty, filthy fed here. Nothing to say on rules and laws regarding classified documents. Just want to say next week I'll be stationed in Japan. So no more super chats for me. Awesome. Oh. Well, have, a, have a good trip. And uh, thank you for supporting the show. And thank you for being our uh, fed liaison. Appreciate it. Fed, 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 Semper fed, fed, fed. fed. That's a long sounder, too. <laughs> it's too long, Ted. Fix it. I know. Uh, yeah. Dems who say they want Trump or in jail are full of BS. Can I read? If Trump goes to jail, the Dems have nothing to campaign on and the GOP unifies and takes over. That's why we know the January 6th committee is a fraud. One of many reasons we know that mm. is true. Uh, James, again, thanks you. thank you for your time. Keep up the great work and great reporting. My dog is with the parents and I'm going to miss her so much. As for what happens here, well, China is now my main focus. Good luck in the U.S. Love you. We love you too. Thank you for all of your commentary. Thank you and God's speed. Yeah, especially. Uh, if people don't remember, James had a lot to offer in terms of, uh, well, his assessment of the, the Mar-a-Lago situation and the classified documents and all of that. Very controversial to some people because James had, a, a, I think, fair to say, a more critical view of Trump. But I appreciate that. And he has some knowledge yeah. that um, that is certainly more sophisticated than I understand about how all of this works. So thank you, James, for your insight and for your support. Semper Ad Melior. Dems, I just read that one. What happened here? Oh, disturbed 2K7. Hey, guys. Had to go on a group freight, a grapefruit break after the interview and came back at Fetterman Bit. Give me a quick replay. Also, blonde looking glam, as always. Matt Sheesh Boy. What? Love you guys. God bless. Yee. Thank you. My natural Yee. beauty is what drives this show. I will not have it insulted. I'm just wearing a hoodie. I'm just <laughs> trying to be like Matt. Yeah. Uh, son of the Wolf. Doesn't Fetterman also have Fetterman, a huge yeah. <laughs> growth of some sort on his neck? That's why he wears hoodies. Is that why oh. I wear hoodies? Do I have a Fetterman growth? He does. Know. Like, does he have like a? Oh, you haven't oh. seen it. I haven't seen it. Oh my god! Well, let me see if okay. I can well, find you, you the link. Some? Yeah, Here, keep no, going. I'll look it. I'll look it up. You, you, you. Oh, okay. You, well, I would like to put it. I, I, I know that the. Uh, oh God. I know that the uh, the audience has probably seen it. What is Google curated this? Why is it not showing up? Homeboy has a fat neck. Let me, let me, no, it's not just a fat neck. He has like a, a, a giant tumor in it. it. I don't think it's a tumor. I think he just has like a fat, this is, lumpy head. This is the image right here. Let me. Uh, no, let uh, me have you seen this one of Fetterman and then the tumor on his neck is another Fetterman? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I have not seen that, That's although right. I would like to. But this is the image that, that people most commonly <laughs> reference. Uh, do you have your uh, Skype open? I put open up on my phone. Th- that uh, is what most people think of when they talk about his lumpy neck and why he chooses to wear hoodies most commonly yeah this is the p- picture where the, the fetterman has another fetterman growing out of his neck. yeah <laughs> it does kind of uh, look like that that's great just needs a little that's goatee great. on it yeah do you want do you want to read it uh who's really up next a little goatee. Uh, eric burns marsh is that what uh <laughs> yeah okay uh matt we are uh 13 of the population but we are more than 52 percent of your hoax hate incidents stop picking on us signed homer Mm. I have no idea what the demographic breakdown is on that particular crime or not. Uh, knuckle hunky buck. I can knuckle hunky hunky buck. When a black teen makes a claim that they're going to kill another black teen. Uh, uh, he, yeah, he says it's not, it's usually not, excuse me. It's usually not a threat. It's a promise. That's like Ooh. potentially way too true. I mean, they, 
yeah, there are uh, that that is a problem. There is a general a theme of murder that happens frequently in that context. As Eterica Unbound, uh, it's hard to imagine the pain of losing a child. How much worse uh, must it be to lose a child in an act of evil? Uh, yeah. How worse still for the act to be a political football? Where do they find space to grieve? Yeah, uh, that and that's yeah, yeah exactly. It, it, Parkland has become so politicized, of course, too, and and you got uh, other families who choose to be out for the purposes of gun control and all these other things. Like, I have the same amount of respect for the loss for the Petties or any other family who's experienced something like that. Mm -hmm. The frustrating thing is when it's politicized to tell my family that our rights need to be violated Maybe in response. Yeah. Uh, and that is an important political fight. I appreciate the petties for taking that on too, for standing up for the values of freedom, despite uh, personal loss. I think, you know, if you ask them, they would say, well, I don't, I don't put those things at odds. I don't think that those are contrasting things. I don't think that my family would be saved by taking away your family's freedom. Of course, other families in Parkland, I don't want to misrepresent them, but do seem to think that, that if only people disarmed your family, that there would be more safety and less likelihood of this sort of outcome. But yeah, but yeah, the politics of this, I think, make it all the more toxic. Uh, President Migtama says, I haven't been able to watch live in a while. Sorry for that. Uh, no, do not apologize for tuning in and supporting the show. But he says, I'm busy moving my family from uh, Oregon to Arkansas. We considered Idaho and Montana, but I lived in Great Falls briefly. Too damn cold for me. Love you. Well, thank you for supporting the Where show. Where is Great Falls again? Great Falls is uh, kind of north central Montana, a little west. Oh, uh, okay. But that's probably three hours north of me here in Bozeman. Oh, okay, gotcha. Uh, you know, uh, I don't I don't think the winters in Bozeman are really too bad. They're not like North Dakota. Or something That's like that. That's true. Yeah. However, I've lived in northern climates pretty much my entire life. So if you're not used to winter, like, yeah, we have winter. But. It doesn't get that cold here ever. No, it's you might get a few sub-zero days a year. Like maybe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe two below zero nights or something like that. It's not a lot. It's that Seattle weather, though. Yeah. Uh, Son of the Wolf says, I thought the Truman Show sucked when I saw it as a child, too. I guess I'm going to have to go back and revisit it as an adult. Yeah, I. I, I could see people not liking it for certain reasons, but in the context of what's going on now, it seems like I felt like the Leonardo DiCaprio meme pointing at the screen like that. That's what they're doing. That's what they're doing right now. That's them. They're telling us how they did this 20 years before they did it. Uh, Jenny Bath says one of the things that right wing Christians struggle with is to love their enemies because they view this as submitting to their enemies. But we need to remember Romans 12, 19 through 21. Do not take revenge. And he continues, uh, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath for it is written. It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If he is thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Oh God, I don't think I have that in me. Like, Ooh. I don't think I could do that. That's all, that's all, um, well and good. Like talk to me when somebody murders your child. Hmm. I, I just, well, I just could never find that in my heart. I don't have what it takes to do that. Well, we heard, uh, the petties mention they find comfort in believing that they Family. will be reunited with their daughter one day. That's I think true, this yeah. is something of an extension of similar reasoning that, whatever injustice may exist in this world, you have faith that there is a broader justice beyond it. And that that justice will be enforced by the ultimate yeah. power that that is. Uh, so I, I certainly hope so. Um, I understand how difficult that is in the earthly context, that the idea that I'm going to maintain morality and standards of decency against people who not only don't uphold that, but commit the greatest atrocities imaginable. Uh, that is probably the ultimate uh that that's like an inhuman level of of patience and grace that we could say yeah. is is not even deserved maybe that's not even a moral thing to you can make a moral argument against it i suppose but, but why uh, do we have the desire for vengeance hmm. in our heart i don't think that that's satan hmm. i think that's a god-given thing like why even put that desire in our hearts i don't get it the godly argument for vengeance blondes book coming out soon maybe 
there's been a lot of godly vengeance over the years. Histor- uh, history has seen some examples. That's true. Vanessa Stuller or Stuller says, I disagree about Truman in the loop. Haven't we all thought um, that traffic was against us at some time or another? We switch lanes in traffic and then the lane suddenly stops. Grr. Yeah. The, what I'm saying is if you lived in a world where all of those things, there was never anything else to compare it to. Although I guess if you're going to say like, well, in this world, sometimes traffic is bad and sometimes it's not. Maybe in Truman's world, sometimes the loops happened and sometimes they ran out of staff and they had to have more people doing more like the same guy doing more loops than usual. I don't know. It just there seems like several instances where he's using standards of the outside world to evaluate the world of the island. And that's hard for me to understand how he gets the basis to compare. That's true. Okay. But I see where you I see what you're saying, Vanessa. Uh, Colton Regal says, just want to thank you guys. I've been bedridden for the past three days for depression. Uh, the show finally managed Aww. to get me up for a bit. Happy birthday and anniversary, Matt. Well, thank you, Colton. And thank you for your support for the show. And I certainly hope that you're doing better. Uh, and thanks for thanks for chiming in tonight. Yeah. You want to take over? Sure. Vanessa Stiller. Did you read this? No, you did. Um, Hillbilly Deluxe. Body count with two. She feels like she might be missing out with 10 plus whoever she is currently with will never live up to all the comparison subjects she already has. Hmm. Yeah, but like what's the threshold between nine and ten? It seems arbitrary. Yeah, maybe. Um, and I don't think women remember their sexual encounters with the same vivid kind of memory that men men do. Like I, I just don't think that women are like that. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I have I have no basis for comparison. Just like uh, I think Truman. men reflect on their relationships more than than women do. I don't know. Maybe they're more sensitive. I don't know. I feel like men and men hit it and forget it. That's more of like a male attitude. I don't know. I think that maybe there's like a lot of emotional attachment in men, or at least their memory is, is better. Hmm. I had this boyfriend for th- like three years, and this was a long time ago. And then last year, I was sitting around, and I could not remember his last name. Really? A three-year boyfriend? You can't remember? Three his... years. Wow, and that's I, harsh. I was devastated by the breakup and everything like that. And then I was just thinking about it. And, you know, it didn't come to me for like like a week. You uh, Can I speculate there was a lot of marijuana consumption at the time? Yeah, but three years. Like, you know, <laughs> we were talking about getting married and like you know, I met his family. And what? he met my family. And like, it wasn't, you know, it was like a serious relationship. And it was wow. just like when it was over, I was like. Okay, I guess I'm never going to think about you again. And then, <laughs> and then I guess that's I, I good. Just forgot his that's last the point thing. of a breakup. I don't know. I mean, I think that women might be different, although I'm probably not representative. Um, Cam Girl is sooner. The divorce rate being high for two partners specifically is likely due to cases of extramarital affairs, i.e., oh. the woman was cheating. That can't be because a, a woman that has had one previous sexual partner would be no more likely to cheat would be less likely to cheat than than women that have had more sexual partners right are they measuring partners pre-marriage or it just said well no it would have been pre-marital sexual partners okay because then that would eliminate the possibility that you had just your spouse but then you cheated on your spouse yeah yeah it would have been two beforehand yeah anyway uh phil does Um, offer a point of clarification apparently there was uh an 18 year old football player uh, and there was a, a killer of color two weeks ago and his parents uh, immediately started groveling. Oh, Phil, we needed the context. We didn't know what the hell you were talking about. I don't know the case. Yeah. Um, Esoteric Unbound. Is it just me or does Fetterman look like he should be playing the role of Satan's butt monkey in some low budget <laughs> horror movie from the 70s? Ding, ding, ding. Maybe I should uh, be Fetterman for Halloween. Fetterman with a Fetterman growth. I like it. Your woman could do something with that. She probably could. You're going to have to wear a bald cap. Yeah. I, I've, I've, you know, we were talking about Depp. I was like, am I going to shave my facial hair to match Depp? You um, absolutely are. In this if case, I'd that. have to, I mean, I could just shave my head totally and be Fetterman and put a lump, but that's a big commitment. Is it? Well, I, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's like everything's got to grow a bald back. cap, bald cap, bald cap, bald look. cap. No, I don't know. We'll, we'll, ta- we'll you don't talk. want to shave your head, man. It, you don't want to do that. Chet we'll, uh, we'll Daryl talk Brooks options. did nothing wrong. <laughs> Good Lord. Thank you. 
knuckle hunky book a robin d banks we'll settle out of court i'll let you matt and i once me and then you can make me a sandwich if you drop the lawsuit oh, i like the, wow. the war the super chat war you guys are having even though you could totally just talk offline um but you know we're getting rich because you guys want to talk to each other on is, super chat is this Great. a budding romance between uh mr hunky buck and robin do you think they're banging wouldn't that be <laughs> Hmm. Chimp in a bow tie. The difference is that no right wing judge would lower himself to hold an absurdist star chamber like the AJ AJ uh, AJ non trial. The left can weaponize the judiciary with willing fifth columnists on the bench. Yeah, I suppose. Eric Burns March. One of our black presidents, Alexander Hamilton, <laughs> did not have a dark complexion. Signed Homer. That sounds um, historically correct. Did I read all these? Yeah. Uh, Ryan has chat is a bunch of really funny people. I love them dearly. I don't know why that sounds really mean. And there, there, there are a lot of jokes that have come out of the super chat that I wish I had thought of. That happens on pretty much a a nightly basis or at least a stream by stream basis. Yeah. 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 But they're also motherfuckers. Everyone. (laughs) Uh, Michael mammoth. She was my first love. She dumped me because her friend said I wasn't good enough for her and wasn't going anywhere in life. It's a little extra spice of life. Well, there you go. Oh, Proved that wrong, sucks. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. John H. As a wise man once said, signs and symbols rule the world. Do yourself a favor and look into sun worship symbolism. Also, do Catholics read their Bibles? It literally says, call no man father. Mm. Do I read my Bible? Ugh. Come to the Bible study. I know. I Not read my book. Bible as Matt almost Christensen every Saturday night. That's true. I have someone read it to me, actually. That's it's even better. actually a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> um, Knuckle Hunky Bug, blonde in response to something from the Bible. Tell me to tell that to me when someone murders your child. Like what on a cross, blonde? Ooh, Touché. Ooh. Touché. Got her. Holy cow. You got cow. me there. Um, yeah. I, and I know God has a sense of vengeance, too. Uh, that's why I believe it's not of Satan. I believe that um, that vengeance is a is a quality reflected in, in, in God's God's vengeance. I think we're good. Uh, well, I have one more from John. Sometimes you are the instrument of God's wrath. The trouble is knowing that you are correct in your actions and won't have to pay the piper. Sometimes you need to have faith that they get justice. Well, I certainly uh, hope that that is the case, regardless of our uh, humanly attempts at justice. I hope there's a uh, something bigger than that when it's all, uh, when it's all over. Me too. Uh, I think we're all set. Uh, yeah, awesome. we're good over on uh, on D Live. Let me give one quick refresh. We will call it uh, we will call it a stream. Yeah, we're good. So thank you guys as always for uh, hanging out with us this evening. Appreciate your contributions to the show, your chats and your jokes and uh, all your various messages. Appreciate you tuning in. Of course, thank you to the Petty family, Ryan and Ian, for giving us their time and talking about what is uh, understandably something very difficult to talk about. Appreciate them for that and if you're listening later to the show on demand thank you kindly as well for tuning in and perhaps you're listening and you think i just can't get enough i need more i must have more to listen to as no I one is thinking that there no are one. audio feeds of the show and you can get the show on all sorts of different podcast platforms mattchristensenmedia.com slash podcast we have extra material on the audio platforms in fact uh we will be back next sunday because if it's Sunday, sorry, Chuck Todd, it does not meet the press. It is the Matt and Blonde Show. Have a great night and a great week. Bye, guys.